rightly or wrongly, the Fed views the labor markets as the conduit to achieve their inflation objectives. I think the whole inflation fear is way overdone and it's starting to leak into the data. We've not yet seen that turnaround in U.S. inflation that will really get the Fed to actually cut rates rather than just pause the hikes. Now, the odds of recession are very high, but we haven't seen the whites of the eyes of that recession yet. I think there's an argument you're starting to price in a mild recession, but you're certainly not pricing in something severe. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good to see you back. How was jury duty? It was good. It's a great thing in America, and New York City does it better than Wonderful. anybody. You sound they inspired this morning. A man and a woman that, that revolutionized it, and the rest of the country copied it. Should we start the show? Cool. Start yeah, the, show. You know, the judge looked at me and said, I know you. And then he said, see ya. Well, I'm from New York <laughs> I was up by 10 a.m. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. What a day we've got coming up for you. An ECB rate decision, earnings from Apple and Amazon, yeah. TK. We've got to talk about Credit Suisse as well. Futures unchanged on the S&P. Credit Suisse over in Zurich, right. down we, and down hard. Why are we talking about this, folks? We're talking about this because for the Bloomberg world and global Wall Street, this is painful. And somewhat clear, Lisa was mentioning before the show, a little opaque. But, John, what I would suggest here is I am focused on the dilution at hand, the stock down 12 percent, down 16 percent earlier. It's 10 percent to the Saudis and a further dilution. The way you spell rights, folks, rights is not seen in America, John. Spell rights, D-I-L-U-T-I-O-N. Dilution. It is dilution. It's That's a four billion doing. Swiss franc rights issue. And, Tom, it's the rights issue that I think a lot of equity investors wanted to avoid, and ultimately <clears throat> they can't avoid it. And, Tom, there's two other issues at play here as well. You've got the rights issue, you've got the terrible earnings, and then you've got the reorg. So can we talk about the reorg? Can you make sense of the reorg this morning? Yeah, they want to be James Gorman. Simple as that. And, you know, there's another, in the FT, there's an article on Nachman over at Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs wants to be James Gorman. Everybody wants to do wealth management and the consistent cash flows generated. That's different than doing SPACs. We need to talk about what First Boston ultimately becomes, Lee. So that's going to be the spin-off for the investment bank. Royce is reporting just moments ago, by the way, that they're considering an IPO for that particular unit. They're looking for outside funding to help provide some of the risk-weighted capital to go out and really build out the leveraged finance unit that really had been the stalwart of Credit Suisse for so long when they merged with DLJ uh, back around 2000. So how much can they really recreate that using private capital without necessarily some of the consumer deposits? And then also I'm curious about what kind of equity uh, stakes some of the senior managers who are taking this on have. That stock looks ugly. We're down by 10, 11 percentage points this morning. TK, if you want even uglier than that, Look at Meta. Facebook is down 20% yeah. in the pre-market. Julian Emanuel, well, Julian Emanuel writing for Evercore that after Meta, after what we saw with Google, sorry, Facebook, Google, there I go, now it's clear. Uh, after what we saw there, Amazon and Apple today are ever more important, but I really take issue with people that compare even Google with the cash flow streams of Amazon and Apple. Uh, Facebook is not in the mix at all no. anymore after the damage to that market cap so far this year. I want to whip through the price action for you outside of equities, which, as I say, are unchanged on the S&P 500. And look at the bond market. Yields are higher by five or six basis points, just north of 4% on a 10-year. Kind of been hanging out at that level over the last couple of days on a 10-year maturity in the Treasury market. In the FX market, euro just slightly weaker. Euro dollar down four-tenths of 1%. 10041 on euro dollar. TK, a weaker euro going into an ECB rate decision a little bit later. Weaker euro, but coming back over the last couple of days and combined with the equity market, John, you mentioned in our two-hour meeting before we were on air uh, that the idea that SPX has actually done better than the tech bang-up of the last couple of days, and you see it with as with euro goes to parity, stronger euro, VIX from 30.31 into 27.55. There's some oddities right now in this important Thursday. I think that was a story yesterday, Tom. If you strip <clears throat> out the muscle of big tech and just go to the equal weight S&P 500, right. it was positive yesterday. So the pain you saw in Alphabet, the yeah. pain you saw in Microsoft, yeah. it didn't bleed. It didn't yeah. bleed in a major way. 20% of SPX market cap this afternoon. Unreal, isn't it? Yeah. A couple of names. Just fantastic. Lisa, looking forward to that, the earnings and an ECB rate decision later this morning. Yeah, and John, you were talking about how yesterday, if you stripped out some of the big tech names, you actually saw a positive return on the equal weighted S&P. The reason why? The step down. I know you guys are incredibly excited. Do we get the step down in the ECB today? Not necessarily at the 8.15 a.m. rate decision where they are widely expected to go with 75 basis points, raise rates by that, and across the board raise all of their benchmark rates. But in terms of December, 
do they go to 50? <coughs> do they even potentially go to 25 basis points? We get an 845 pr uh, press conference with ECB's Christine Lagarde. How much does she signal they are concerned about the pain? And what is the litmus test of the euro? Does the euro weaken further if they signal a step down? Or does it actually uh, gain in terms of the potential for some sort of economic growth? At 8.30 a.m., U.S. Uh, Q3 GDP figures. This is the first read that we get. Really digging under the surface. Maybe we get a positive read after two consecutive quarters of a negative print, kind of eradicating some of the claims about a technical recession. Do we get a more optimistic look there? And then initial jobless claims, why are we not seeing them really tick up? They are still at historic lows, even as the Fed aggressively goes after raising the unemployment rate. And as we hear some of these big tech names really talking about potentially cutting back pretty substantially some of their staffs. And after the bell, Apple and Amazon uh, report earnings, also Intel. And I'm curious to see them as well from the chip sector. But Apple and Amazon front and center. Apple, importantly, John, how much can they remain the cash cow? How much can they remain the story of you could all doubt me, you can all think that we're not going to necessarily perform, especially in light of what we're seeing at the Intels uh, and the other t chip producers in the world, but we continue to outperform. Is that going to still be the story today? Hey, Lisa, thank you. TK, if there's one name that can define an earnings season, it's Apple. And we've been talking about lowering the bar for the last couple of weeks. We've had the report here at Bloomberg that maybe iPhone demand is faltering. Tom, how many times have we set that gun into the print? And as we often say, they knock it out of the park. Well, they knock it out of the park. And again, it's going to be the same with Amazon. And that's a subset. How do services do at Apple? It's, you know, I sound like Dan Ives here, which is not my, my job. But the answer is, John, you're right. They always are these angst, these worries. What I would point out, particularly to American listeners and viewers, is I believe there's another price war at the phone carriers to move units. I see the same thing. And, and, and that I'm not sure how that folds in. We'll catch up with the Apple story a little bit later. Let's start with the ECB story this morning and speak to Katrina Dudley, the portfolio manager and research analyst at Franklin Mutual Series. Can we just speak with him with the ECB, Katrina? We're looking for 75 a little bit later. What are you looking for? I think we're all looking for 75, so you're right in the ballpark there. What would be the surprise here is if they do 50. Um, you know, you've seen the the bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia do 50. The Canadians followed fairly quickly, um, and so the the ECB does have the flexibility to do a 50 basis point and a little bit of a wait and see. And we've seen some kind of softening in the PMI data. Take a look at the eurozone numbers. There were a weaker than we're expecting. A lot of that weakness is coming in Germany, which is really that manufacturing hub of Europe. So you know, we we are expecting 75. The surprise here would be 50. Katrina, is there a theory to that? Is there some form of grounding of economics in these adjustments from Canada, maybe from ECB, maybe, dare I say, from the Fed, or is it they're just making it up as they go? Um, everyone here is making it up as they go because we really have not been in this position for so many decades. Um, the, the, the caution with the ECB is twofold. First of all, if you go back and you know, post the GFC, they tightened too quickly um, and they acted too quickly in the past. So I think that there is a little more hesitancy at the ECB than there are in other markets. The second thing is that we really don't you know, understand here in the United States, Europe's faced a, a triple whammy here. They've They've had the war crisis, they've had an energy crisis, and they're facing monetary um, tightening. And so the combination of those three, I think, puts them a little more on the cautious edge. That said, I really do want to say that we are probably in line with the market, expecting 75 basis points. What we're really paying attention to is the forward guidance and any signaling you get as to what they're going to do in that next meeting. So let's talk about the potential reaction to that, Katrina. Yesterday, we saw the Bank of Canada surprise to the downside with respect to how big the rate hike was. This was the step down that people were looking for. People have looked to the Bank of Canada to really be on the front foot with setting a tone for central banks. If the ECB follows that and signals only a 25 basis point rate hike in December, what's the reaction? Does the euro strengthen? Do we end up seeing actually more expectations of growth in the euro region or do we see the long end yield spike and further weakness in the euro? 
what you're going to see is the market's going to react positively because what they see is that the the ECB is accommodating the fact that the PMIs are slowing and by slowing down the pace at which they increase interest rates, they're giving support to the overall economy. The risk here and the risk that we're really focused on in the United States, in Europe as well, is that the rise in rates chokes off an economic recovery. So if they temper that rise in rates, they're likely to see that that economic recovery has some small level of incremental support. I do say it is a much smaller level of support. Um, in terms of Australia and Canada, though, I do want to point out one small thing is the transmission mechanism there for those rate reductions. So instead of doing the 75, they did the 50, is much quicker and cleaner because the, the housing markets there are um, variable rate mortgages. In the United States and in more of Europe, um, the UK is an exception, you don't have as much of that debt and that mortgage debt. So the transmission mechanism there isn't as fast as it is in those other Commonwealth markets. Hey, Katrina, wonderful to hear from you to kick off our coverage today. What a Thursday we've got coming up. Katrina Dudley there of Franklin Mutual Series. <coughs> TK, the depot rate could double a little bit later from 75 well, to 150. And what's great about this, folks, is we have John Farrow with years of experience on the lawn at Frankfurt, and I believe Maria Tadeo is there today. We're going to catch up with the later. The two of you together on this, because I would know the depot from the repo from the whatever from rate. From the Taltro. And it, it, exactly. And, and the <laughs> answer is the body language of the press conference is going to be really, really interesting. We'll bring you those headlines on radio and television through the morning. I actually think this moment is a lot more simple to understand because we're seeing it play out in the United States increasingly too. You're going to see some political pushback, Tom. Huge. In a much, much bigger Can't. way. Look at the data in Europe right now. Look, the PMI is in the 40s, and they're going to hike 75 basis points. You're going to laugh at me because I've been screaming about this for months. There's a point where you walk towards neutrality. Maybe it's 75 beats sure. now. Maybe it's 50. What do I know? And then every step from there becomes excruciatingly difficult. And we are there right now. Jamie Diamond at J.P. Morgan spoke to CNBC in the last couple of weeks, and he talked about the next 100 basis points of tightening from the Fed being the most painful 100 basis points. I'd extend things just a little bit, Lisa. I think politically it's going to be the most painful 100 basis points, not just for the Fed, but maybe for the ECB as well. I would agree. I also think, though, that at this point, if they don't continue to hike, what is the response from the bond vigilantes on the long end? Do you start to see borrowing costs surge in a way that becomes political and tenable regardless of what they do? The ECB decision coming up a little bit later. Earnings from Apple and Amazon. What a Thursday. Some economic data coming up at 8.30 Eastern time. We'll break that down with Mike McKee. Coming up shortly, Sharon Bell at Goldman Sachs in the next hour. Looking forward to that. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The European Central Bank is set to lift main interest rate hikes to the highest level in more than a decade. It's trying to lower record high inflation. Almost all economists surveyed by Bloomberg predict a second straight 75 basis point hike today. President Xi Jinping in China is willing to work with the U.S. to find ways to get along. The comments came before a possible meeting with President Biden next month at a Group of 20 summit. It signals an effort on Xi's part to maintain ties despite disputes over everything from Taiwan to chips to the invasion in Ukraine. Russia has carried out military exercises simulating a retaliatory nuclear strike. Vladimir Putin oversaw the drills. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told Bloomberg that the U.S. has warned Russia that any use of nuclear weapons in the war against Ukraine would have grave consequences. And Credit Suisse is planning a sweeping overhaul. It includes $4.1 billion in capital raise, a carve-out of its investment bank, and thousands of job cuts. It's the most urgent attempt yet to repair Credit Suisse after huge losses and management chaos. In breaking up the investment bank, the firm will create a separate advisory and capital markets business that will revive the first Boston branding. And the world's richest man told Twitter employees he doesn't plan to cut 75 percent of staff. Bloomberg's learned that Elon Musk denied the numbers in an address to workers at the company's San Francisco office. Still, the billionaire is expected to cut staff when he takes over the company, causing anxiety among workers. The $44 billion deal set to close Friday. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We want to go through the transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation 
also with very strong cattle days. It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. What a tough morning for everyone working at Credit Suisse this morning. Good morning to you. That was the Credit Suisse CEO. The stock is down in Swiss trading by almost 12%. From New York, let's get to the price action. What a day we've got coming up for you. <coughs> Outside of Credit Suisse, we've got earnings from Apple and Amazon after the close. We've also got an ECB rate decision. Equities look like this on the S&P. We're positive on the S&P by almost a tenth of 1%. Yield to higher by six basis points on a 10-year. Just north of 4%. The euro's weaker. Going into that ECB call a little bit later, Tom. Euro dollar just above parity still a one handle on the euro for global wall street now a, an informed conversation on the disaster known as credit suisse this is trading on a book value basis this is off the bq screen on bloomberg it is apples and oranges 1.4 something for jp morgan a little bit better for morgan stanley really showing the successful decade of james gorman and credit suisse zero 0.24. That's all you need to know. That's what Marcus Ashworth knows of Bloomberg Opinion steeped in EU banking. Marcus, you and I go to dilution, except you and I know the calculation of equity dilution is complex and is usually something failed on a CFA exam. How bad will the equity dilution be for shareholders of Credit Suisse? Well, I think they're learning a lesson of uh, their compatriot uh, banks, you know, what Swiss Bank, which merged into Union Bank of Switzerland to create the UBS model. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you know, UBS decided to cut through, you know, muscle, bone, everything to just to get to a level whereby they could be appreciated on the stock market. Um, it looked like, you know, wanton destruction as we are looking at Credit Suisse now and seeing, you know, all sorts of things going on, which, you know, look unpalatable. And, and and silly in some senses. Some of the most profitable parts of the bank are right. going to be hived off. But if it results in, as you said, that tangible book value of 0.25 or whatever it is, doubling and then going again up towards just tangible book value at some point in the next few years, that will be deemed a success. And that's right. all the management care about. Marcus, what is the timeline to find the formal dilution of these set of transactions? To me, it's a three-year timeline, even though they're talking it up in a cup of coffee. Is it three years or is it even longer until you let the dust settle on dilution? Oh, I think there's got to be substantive, you know, real results well before that. There may take an, a, a, a one or two years beyond that, but you've got to have the direction of travel clearly laid out. They need partners clearly on uh, on the investment bank CSFB. Um, you know they need partners in, into the structured um, part of the product group or, or, or sale thereof. They need real results and something absolutely clearly happening. It's Credit Suisse is, is about a private bank, a wealth management, and asset management. The rest of it, you know, is important but is not vital, and that's clearly what they're showing here. The amount of capital they're putting in investment banking. The hiving off the successful glory bits of states, stateside stuff, that's where the money still is. The European side, not so much. That's going to get with it on the bone. Marcus, uh, Credit Suisse is its own animal. It has its own pain. It has its own story. But it is within the microcosm of the European banking system, which faces a sort of regime change today, potentially, if the ECB doubles the deposit rate, if they double the benchmark rate. Uh, they've been used to the highest levels in more than a decade. How much does that change the scenario in a positive way for banks that have been looking for higher yields, higher rates for a very long time? Uh, difficult one, not very much. I mean, especially if it causes a recession, which is quite likely, I think, in my mind, that you know we're already probably in a recession in Europe, and it's going to get worse. So hiking interest rates and uh, doing some other things as well. I think it's the other bit, the complex monetary plumbing bit, which is these excess reserves. A lot of banks borrowed up to two trillion euros at as low as negative one percent. They've got that free money locked in. And as, as you say, if deposit rates go up to 1.5, they can sit and park their money back at the ECB at 1.5%. What a lovely round trip. That's too generous. And clearly, the ECB will want to do something about that. If they overdo it, they're going to cause a, a liquidity withdrawal, a potential financial conditions nightmare, like we saw in the UK recently, and perhaps a collateral squeeze as well. They may lose control of their money market rates. They could get this very wrong. They could get sued. There's all sorts of things that, they, that could go wrong with a positive rates for the ECB is quite a new world. They are so used to negative rates, they haven't quite worked out what it's like uh, above ground.
Which raises a question about what they're going to do in December, and that's what people are really looking for today at the ACB rate decision in terms of whether they ratchet back some of their plans to raise rates. Do you think that that's what the market is basically asking for and that financial stability will be an increasingly pressing concern if they signal an ongoing aggressiveness? Yeah, I think the answer to, to this all lies, as ever, not with ECB, but in the Federal Reserve. What the Fed do on November 2nd is key to everything. If the Fed do slightly pivot or say that the next hike won't be something like another 75, it gives the ECB the freedom they so need and want to perhaps only do 50 in December uh, and probably will stop it either there or very soon thereafter. They will talk a bigger book. They have to, to keep that euro buck above par parity. So it's gone back above first time for quite a while. Uh, they'll want to keep it above parity and therefore they'll want to keep talking, but they really want the Fed to ease off. You'd have to imagine, Marcus, by the time we get to December, there's a forecast that spouts out recession. Isn't that, is that avoidable? No, I, no way. I, I think absolutely UK, Europe, they're already in recession in all but name, and it can only get worse the more they hike interest rates, let alone talk about withdrawing stimulus too hard. They get the continent tightening wrong and all yep. this reduction of excess reserves, a world of pain is coming. Marcus Ashua, thank you, sir, out of London. That's the problematic view of things, Tom, when it comes to the ECB. The fact that their base case doesn't include oh. right now a recession in the eurozone. Next forecast, I believe, come in December, and when they sit down in December... Tom, you'd have to imagine there's some form of downturn, some real downturn in that outlook. And well, yeah. how do you hike again 50, 70 basis points I, if that's I, the case? I was remiss, John. I didn't look at this when I came in this morning. And it is the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which I've mentioned a number of times. England and America are very close. And they've improved here over the last number of days. ECB is Stunningly sure. different. It, this is a different press conference than what we're going to see from Chairman There Powell. is one really big piece of good news, though, in Europe when it comes to the gas Energy. price story. Yeah. Uh, Lisa is so much better than it could have been at this time of year, primarily because it's been warmer than most people thought it would be. And I'm, this is what I'm struggling to understand. At what point... Is this a positive development that has really fully been bled through into markets versus what everyone seems to be saying? Just wait until actually the winter comes because it hasn't sure. gotten cold yet. And uh, I was reading a story about daylight savings time being actually a nightmare uh, for the European region because people turn on their lights earlier and that uses up more energy. There are all sorts of things that people are looking for. I know you look skeptical, but these no, are some no, of the I've things been, that I've are been like, looking you know, forward to getting rid of that for a long, long time. Yeah. Haven't you? I wonder how Changing much pressure the there is. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how much pressure there is this time from an energy perspective, because it creates a little we bit more. We, we fall back. You fall back. We fall back. Oh, of course. We spring and forward. You spring forward. Thank you. That's right. That's my <laughs> value add for the day. <laughs> we'll all remember that, Tom. Thank That's you. My value add. Three hours away from the opening bell. Here's the price action for you. Starting with the equity market on the S&P 500. Futures just about positive on the S&P. Let's call it unchanged. On the Nasdaq right now, we're negative a half of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. Meta is down and down hard. But like yesterday, it's not bleeding in a major way. We're down about 19% on Meta. Yesterday, we were down hard on Alphabet. Call it Google, Tom. Down hard on the likes of Microsoft. We were Different off by hard. almost Different 8%. Hard. But as I say, if you strip it out, if you equal weight that S&P, we were positive yesterday today, Tom, and I think that might be a surprise for some people you out there. You followed this closer than me, but it, it, there's got to be a separation here. This is about Mr. Zuckerberg, right? Oh, I without mean, a it, doubt. It's like a, it's like the must thing with the sink walking into Twitter. It's a, I mean, Google's about Google, right? Sheryl Sandberg has left. <laughs> Facebook is kind of a mess right now. The outlook, they're investing in a very Lisa uncertain future, Bramo. Yeah, she's got the Bramo The metaverse, <laughs> the rebrand. <laughs> Take your pick. Well, how much is this really the push-pull of the negativity, yes, of Meta, Facebook has its own challenges, but we're seeing the same thing across the big tech names that have reported. How much is this the specific uh, situation of FX headwinds and an economic downturn on one side, and then the step down, the potential for the Fed to not hike rates quite as much as people had expected on the other, providing optimism to the other sectors? I, I thought, it's the push-pull. I thought Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro was just awesome yesterday, sat in that chair, and he just said, step down is implicit in the dot plot from the Federal Reserve. This is not news. <laughs> Why did you need a journalist at the Wall Street Journal to, to write this up for you and summarise what people have already said and what is in the guidance? 
I could not agree with him more. And you've raised the issue about how strange it is that we seem to be agreeing. But John mentioned this before air. John and I usually don't talk before air, but, you know, we spent 30 seconds today catching up. And, John, you mentioned it. Everything in the S&P looks good versus the tech challenges that are out there. It's Caterpillar difficult. just out. I'm sorry. Caterpillar's not a tech company, and they're up nicely. They go from a 197 up near a 200. You know, a little bit of a lift there on a cat after earnings. EPS 395, the estimate you know, 318. Pretty good. That's I a mean, big beat, Tom. Maybe that's what we're going to Going to see. Let's do this. Let's dive to the ECB now. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. You can get out of the way of John and his real expertise on this. Christian Scholz is a Citigroup, the deputy chief European economist. Christian, I mentioned earlier the fancy math of the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index for Europe. It is extremely challenging. How much will Christine Lagarde's press conference be treated today, touched today, by the grim financial conditions of Europe? Well, it, it will play a role, uh, I think. The, uh, it, I don't think it will have much of an impact on the rate path, uh, on what Christine Lagarde's going to decide and her team are going to decide today, it's 75 basis point rate hike, uh, or what's going to follow on uh, later. But it will play a role in how they think about reducing the balance sheet, because that is clearly the next thing uh, that's going to come up, uh, that's going to be in focus, I think, also in the press conference today. And that's where they really need to be careful uh, to not make things even worse on the financial conditions side. You know, obviously the Italian question, but there's many other uh, issues in the plumbing of the financial system that need to be dealt with. Sounds like a movie. The, the Italian, Italian question. question is, well, John, jump in here on the balance sheet. Well, I think expert on beyond this. the balance sheet, Tom, the Italian question right now, if you want to deal with that. <laughs> Christian, it's the Italians asking the questions, not the Europeans asking the questions of the Italians. You've got the new prime minister essentially and not subtly going after the ECB about hiking into a downturn and the pain it could cause, backing away from bond buying. Christian, how do you think this ECB will grapple with a different kind of politicisation? Well, they've created a tool, the TPI, the Transmission Protection Instrument, uh, in order to deal with... Uh, spread widening where it's not fundamentally warranted, so where it's not caused by a policy error that uh, governments themselves need to fix. Uh, that is a bit of a warning to this Italian government uh, not to, to play by the rules, um, but it's also a guarantee that if they do, uh, the ECB will be on their side. Will it be enough uh, if trouble really uh, starts uh, hitting uh, the proverbial? Uh, we are a bit skeptical. It's big on paper, this tool, but uh, the, mech you know, the mechanism of actually activating it and everybody agreeing on it, uh, we think is very difficult. So it's, it's clearly a very, very difficult situation, but it starts with Italy itself. They have to play by the rules. With that in mind, is it too early to discuss QT at this meeting? QT will inevitably have to be discussed uh, and will have to be decided and will have to happen the minute the ECB uh, moves beyond neutral on the policy rate because you cannot have uh, the policy rate being restrictive and or stepping on the brakes and at the same time having a, a balance sheet setting which is still supportive to the economy. So at that point, uh, the ECB is going to have to start QT. We don't think that the ECB will reach uh, you know, restrictive territory before the start of 2023. Three. So there's a still a bit of time, and with all the complications, they better take their time in thinking about it. But come, say, April next year, they will be reducing their balance sheet. And come December, they'll probably decide about this. And today, they may even hint uh, when they will do this. They will plan to start that in April. They will plan to continue following the plan. But right now, according to their plan, there will not be a recession in Europe, even though every major Wall Street bank and beyond seems to think that there will be. Do you expect them to revise that expectation today? Well, uh, today is obviously not a meeting with new forecasts. Uh, they clearly signal that things have played out worse than they perhaps expected in their last set of forecasts in September, which will signal that a recession will probably be part of the base case in, uh, in December. We've always said that they won't get very far in their rate hike cycle because of this. But at the same time, inflation is in double digit territory. We'll see in the next few days where it's going next. It is broadening. Um, demand seems to be recovering too fast for supply to catch up. There is a case for the ECB to hike into a recession, of course. Um, and I don't think they'll let a recession of, say, the garden variety stop them. 
You know, Tom, I do wonder how much uh, some of the American tourists end up being part of the demand story, given uh, the fact that everyone and their mother seems to be going over to uh, just, Italy. Just as a quick aside here, but but I think Paris is traditionally uh, 20, uh, 17 percent, 20 percent of French GDP, and then all of a sudden it was 25 percent, then it's 27. With the new tourist boom, I wonder if that tips over 30 yeah. percent of French GDP. And if you look at all the airlines, September and October is the new summer just because people can work remotely. I wonder, Christian, from that perspective, some of the gains that you've seen in the recovery, does this make the ECB's job harder? That if they are not aggressive enough, you end up with inflation that is more persistent and you end up with market vigilantes coming out and penalizing the ECB for their actions. Indeed, there is a strong consensus, uh, at least in parts of the, uh, you know, among observers, that the ECB is behind the curve, that it failed to realize that, you know, all the stimulus that the government's injected in the economy during the pandemic was going to have some impact on, um, a strong impact on demand when supply couldn't recover quickly enough, and that that supports um, uh, inflation, and that raising interest rates earlier maybe would have made uh, made the whole process a little smoother. <clears throat> You know, I think, of course, we all agree that really most of the inflation has nothing to do with the European economy. It comes from external. It comes from Mr. Putin's uh, war in, uh, in in Ukraine and, uh, the, you know, everything that happens around uh, energy, which the ECB cannot do anything about. Um, but, you know, clearly uh, there is a, a, a rise in inflation expectations, which we observe if the ECB doesn't react to that is effectively lowering real interest rates. And <clears throat> that would support demand into a supply crisis, which really can't be the ECB's intention at the moment. Hey, Christian, thank you. Christian Schultz there of City. I want to go back to the earnings from Caterpillar out just moments ago. Third quarter adjusted EPS 395, the estimate 318. This was a number that jumped out for me, Tom. Machinery, energy and transportation revenue, 14.28 <coughs> billion dollars year over year. That is plus 22%. Yeah. And you see that in the organic revenue as well. We've had out here, and this is a busy day uh, with 20% of the market cap, Apple, Amazon later. Honeywell, Southwest Air, Caterpillar, picking them out randomly as well. John, add them all together. They make up 11% huh? of Apple's market cap. I never would have guessed that. Okay, but something's changed with Facebook. No. Did you notice that Chevron and Exxon have bigger market caps now with Facebook? That's yes. a change, Tom. That's a big change. And if you think well, about where the excess has many been. Many would say they should. Where the excess investment has been for the last 10 years, it's been in technology. <clears> so if you think about where the recession might be, it's going to be the investment made in the last 10 years in places like that. Where hasn't the investment been? The CapEx hasn't been there in the same way in the energy names for the last decade. Well, Paul Sankey's Tom. led on that. Paul Sankey's is, Paul is, Sankey, is completely Jeff Curry, led on this. Javier yes. Blast, they've all made the same <clears> point. And... and you, you wonder with the durability of energy. I'm hearing most of the sell side, the zeitgeist, Sam Stovall as well, saying energy is something still that's under-invested, even with the rush to 120 earlier. Even in the face of recession risk. At least that's what's remarkable about that energy call, even in the face of recession risk. Yeah, there's a structural need to invest in some of these areas. Your point, though, about the fact that tech was the leader tech were the names where people would actually invest. Now we're seeing that really punctured. Just to give you some sense of scope with Meta, right, Facebook, their value, their market value has collapsed by $520 billion just in the past year alone. And they're now below the level That's, of the 20 largest yeah. U.S. companies, trading at a 50 percent discount to the NASDAQ 100. Just to give you a sense, that is yeah. the most ever with respect to the discount. I believe that drop is almost double the value of CAT Honeywell in, in a small Southwest area. So, John, this is a reason why I wonder, can these things happen in isolation? Or is there sure. a broader market ramification that we might not have felt yet, especially if it's not a loan? It might be idiosyncratic features for each of these tech companies, but the investment was done during a time of much cheaper financing and much greater ambition for some of the tech names that are finding themselves in a new and environment. And cheaper labor, too. Think yeah. about where the capital was going. It was going to food delivery. Food delivery. $30 salads. Cheap car drives. Don't Cheap taxis, Tom. I mean, sure, it's ridiculous. But, Tom, <laughs> that's where the investment has been. This is why Personal. Jeff Curry of Goldman came out months and months ago and said, this is the revenge of the old economy. Underinvested, and this is the revenge right here on the screen. You see it play out. I, look at the year-to-day performance of tech. Look at the year-to-day performance of Say Energy. What I see, I don't have it in front of me, but those organic revenue. I mean, remember, organic revenue was a GE thing, was a Jack Welch thing. Now we're seeing it everywhere. And the nominal GDP pop we've seen with inflation gives you buoyant organic revenue. And the question is what happens? And the answer is like Coca-Cola the other day. Pricing power is in place, at least for now. Still an inflationary <clears throat> world, Tom. Not a disinflationary bust yet.
Is that well, one for next year? don't tell that to housing market, but I you know, know that's brutal. You know. We'll talk about that later. Futures right now unchanged on the S and P. On the Nasdaq, we're negative by about six tenths of one percent. Coming up, Gene Tenuto, seven thirty Eastern time. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The European Central Bank set to look past growing fears of a recession today. It's expected to raise interest rates by 75 basis points for the second time in a row. The ECB is trying to quell inflation that's running at almost 10 percent, five times the ECB's medium target. The Biden administration has been forced to scale back a plan to impose a cap on Russian oil prices. That follows skepticism by investors and growing risk in financial markets. Instead of strangling the Kremlin's oil revenues by imposing a strict lid on prices, the U.S. and E.U. are likely to settle for a more loosely policied cap police cap at a higher price than once envisioned. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg asking investors for patience. The parent of Facebook is spending billions to pay for its version of virtual reality at a challenging time for digital advertising companies. Meta's shares fell more than 20 percent after it gave a disappointing quarterly revenue outlook. Samsung Electronics has named J.Y. Lee executive chairman of South Korea's largest company. Lee has been expected to take over the post after his father died in 2020. But the move was delayed by corruption investigations and two stints in jail. Among other things, Samsung is the world's biggest chip maker. And going into the midterm election, the American middle class is facing the biggest hit to its wealth in a generation. Still, it's also richer than it's ever been, thanks to a decade of cheap money. That's a conclusion of a Bloomberg News examination that paired new wealth data with an exclusive Harris poll of 100 million adults. Hear more on that story with Bloomberg's new Big Take podcast. There's new episodes every weekday morning. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We're not going to get the full capitulation from companies on 2023. We think it's just going to take longer. We've written about that quite a bit when we read our research. So you know how we're thinking. Uh, we're still bearish in the intermediate term. We don't think the bear market's over, uh, but we do think this tactical rally is going to be big enough to try and, and pivot and trade it and trade it. You know, for those clients, you can do that. Awesome to catch up with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley just yesterday on this program. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Here's the price action for you on the S&P 500. Futures unchanged. A defining characteristic of the last couple of days is that you get big tech, some names getting absolutely hammered, and this market still holding up, particularly if you go equal weight and strip out the big weightings of big tech. Positive yesterday on the S&P 500, despite the fact that the likes of Alphabet and Amazon and Microsoft rather got absolutely hammered top. Microsoft down by almost 8%, Alphabet down 9% <coughs> yesterday. And Facebook this morning, if you want to look at Meta in Meta, the pre-market, down more than 20%. Just a brutal morning for Meta. And you wouldn't guess it, would you? Looking yeah. at the equity market this morning. No, you wouldn't because we've seen some good industrial earnings. People uh, that are not techie and not VR and the rest. Of, I don't really understand it. I'll let you go there. What I'm going to go to now, and we do this with Mandeep Singh, senior technology analyst at Bloomberg, really, really encyclopedic on this, is Mandeep, I looked up at Home Depot, and if I want to go out and buy a sink and walk into Bloomberg Surveillance with a Kohler Memoir sink today, it'll cost me $271.13. Why is Elon Musk carrying a Kohler's Memoir sink into Twitter? Well, I, I think what he's trying to suggest is, look, uh, he's ready to close the deal, and probably, uh, you know, he will be part of how this thing shakes out eventually. No one knows, you know, what sort of changes uh, he's going to make, but clearly he has highlighted, you know, things around cost structure and where they could go with the product. So right. Sync was just a symbol of him uh, uh, trying to suggest that, yes, he's moving <clears throat> ahead. With that. How distant are Amazon and Apple from the follies of Facebook? Well, so Facebook was self-inflicted. Uh, I mean, if you look at the print last night, that was okay in line with consensus. The earnings wasn't bad. It was just the guide around CapEx and the OpEx spend. And 
What's surprising to me and to an extent irresponsible on the part of Mark Zuckerberg is, you know, with any new technology or product, you have an initial launch, you get some market <clears throat> feedback around product fit, commercial success, where are the areas you want to double down on. In this case, he is just doubling the CapEx. Facebook used to have $19 billion annual CapEx. Now he's talking about 34 to 39 billion. And to me, it's just baffling at a time when your top line is uh, decelerating, your business is challenged because of competition from TikTok. Uh, I, I think it's just irresponsible. When you say competition, this is the key, right? That Facebook is known as the place where grandparents post pictures of their grandchildren for their friends. It's not known as basically the TikTok <laughs> of the new generation or even the Instagram, which has been basically fueling them. But even that is losing some of the clout that it used to have to competitors. So at what point is this an existential crisis that really calls into the question uh, the size of this company? And Mark Zuckerberg knows that and is basically burning money to try to figure out what's next. Well, so I will give them credit that they're trying to, you know, leverage a lot of AI to catch up to TikTok. And a lot of that CapEx spend is going towards data centers. So granted, you know, they're trying to narrow that gap that TikTok has through uh, CapEx investments. That is okay. The problem is, uh, you know, the younger demographic has already moved off the platform to your point about, you know, Facebook and Instagram losing uh, that, uh, some of the audience. And with any uh, you know, social network or a consumer internet company, once you lose your critical users, which the younger demographics are, the others will follow and then it's, uh, you know, it's very hard to stop. So that's why he's doubling down. But I still think you know, the fact that he kept highlighting metaverse and AR, VR, and you know, uh, adding more product SKUs around VR at a time when unit sales are declining for VR is just, uh, surprising. Yeah. Know. And I would say that just from personal experience, it seems like it's TikTok and Snap of the younger cohort. On a broader level, though, how much is Facebook really representing something deeper here about how much money was thrown at certain tech companies that might become obsolete or out of style at a time when they still carry massive clout in the index? Is this the tip of the iceberg in terms of investors withdrawing? I don't think so. I, I do think, you know, investments in AI will pay off eventually. You know, you look at a Microsoft or an Amazon AWS, these are secular growth uh, kind of companies. I mean, yes, you will have a digestion phase in terms of cloud spend coming down. But in terms of the runway, this is huge. We, we will need the, uh, the cloud infrastructure, you know, for the foreseeable future, 20, 25 years, and uh, until something else comes up. But you know, AI investment isn't going to go away. The problem is, where do you focus when it comes to those AI investments? And in this case, if it was autonomous driving or something that was more proven or further ahead in terms of commercializing, it's like Alphabet pivoting completely to Waymo and, you know, saying we will double down and yeah. we will add. And, and it just doesn't make sense. You have to do it in, you know, step. And, and uh, that's the part that I, I think uh, uh, Meta is getting it wrong. Amanda, do you get the feeling that Sheryl Sandberg knew what was coming? I probably, any time, you know, a top executive leaves a CFO or, you know, somebody like Sheryl Sandberg, they're kind of, you know, suggesting to you that, that's a yes. yes, they're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, I would agree with that interpretation. Yeah. Just to the chart, John, uh, Facebook down 43% since June 1st. Oh, it's ugly. Exited. Down forty-three exactly. percent from Sandberg Day. And Mandeep Singh there. You call it Sandberg Day. Sandberg Day. Yeah, I, okay. I don't make it up as I go. June, just brutal. I, people company. know where I am on this. I mean, I, the I day they, they went public, we on this, the sure. day they went public, I had David Kirkpatrick and Paul Kodrowski on together. What an honor that was. Yeah. And David Kirkpatrick absolutely nailed the success of Facebook. I was wrong. Kodrowski was wrong. Kirkpatrick, the Facebook effect author, nailed it. I wonder what he would say now. A lot of people enjoying its failure now, Tom. Yeah. Talk a lot about TikTok's success. Have you seen how many people are getting their news from TikTok <clears> now? Yeah. I mean, I know. slightly concerned okay, about well, that, given this the, company's but, association with the Communist Party in I'm, China. We're, we're going to stop the show. Americans this, are getting their news from. We're going to have an internal Bloomberg surveillance show. Welcome, all of you, to an internal meeting. Should we be on TikTok? No. 
That app I have is not people going at Bloomberg suggesting to me I should be on TikTok, and I'm like, no. That app is not going on my phone. No, I, I just don't get it. No interest. Is it branded to destruct? Seriously, Lisa, for us to be on TikTok, hi, the yen is up. Well, but it's not just about that. And to John's point, it's about the ownership of a company at a time of steepening uh, strains between the U.S. and China. It's there's discussion that, yes. about, you know, where the data is coming from, where it's being hosted. And there's this real insecurity about that around one of the main and quickly growing platforms. I will say about Snap, because that's the other one that the kids use, and I will say my kids use, uh, and I see that, you know, they... It makes it sound so old now, doesn't I, it? I can't even tell. I can't so take it. The kids. I know. I'm, I feel like that guy, what's his name? Um, uh, the guy coming in, being like, hey, kids, that's, how's that's, it going? That's Tom these days, isn't yep. it? <laughs> my kids are not on Snap. They're not on TikTok. Congratulations. On oh, you're having a great well, Tom parenting me, situation. Tom calls me young pharaoh. <laughs> Every time he says it, I'm just like, that really shows your rage. Well, I will say, <laughs> Young Pharaoh is not on Snap, I don't think. But the, ki not, the question is, Can you Snap see? didn't report earnings that were that good. They're not getting the ad revenue either that people were expecting. I, don't get me going. You, you thinking of going on TikTok? Don't. No, I'm not thinking of going on TikTok. I got people telling me I should be on TikTok. Who? No, thank you. <clears throat> Who's telling you that? My, well, part of my entourage. You know. Your agent. <laughs> I'm sorry. Rightly or wrongly, the Fed views the labor markets as the conduit to achieve their inflation objectives. I think the whole inflation fear is way overdone and it's starting to leak into the data. We've not yet seen that turnaround in U.S. inflation that will really get the Fed to actually cut rates rather than just pause the hikes. Now, the odds of recession are very high, but we haven't seen the whites of the eyes of that recession yet. I think there's an argument you're starting to price in a mild recession, but you're certainly not pricing in something severe. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keith. Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. The ECB decision coming up later this morning. Big earnings after the close from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures on the S&P essentially unchanged. TK, Credit Suisse in focus, the ECB as well. Yeah, there's a big day here and a big day for earnings as well. But let's sit on ECB right now. We're going to go to the statement. And I take it, John, again, I'm not expert on this, but this is not just about folks. What's the rate? 75 beeps or that. Far more than the Fed. This is about a balance sheet analysis. We need to talk about QT, the potential to wind back that balance sheet. And, Tom, I think things get harder as the year progresses for this ECB. 75 basis points today, <clears> potentially. But then talking about balance sheet unwind as well, potentially all of this going into a recession. And, again, I've said this repeatedly all week. They they are set to do this on a week that we've got PMIs in the 40s in the Eurozone. And you've got energy, as you've mentioned, down as well. I mean, there's, and, and frankly, you've got stability within the United Kingdom. As witnessed, sterling, I haven't looked at it here, 115.61 on sterling, euro, a little bit. It, it's just a change landscape from two weeks Without ago. Without a doubt. The dollar's weaker. Bond yields have backed away from just a week ago. That's given people a little bit more faith, <clears> a little bit more faith in this equity market. But I go back to the ECB, at least 75 basis points into a recession potentially with double digit CPI, not pretty. Well, although I wonder if the weakness is actually going to be, if it comes quickly, a benefit to them to be able to hike, have a recession, and then perhaps a, a clean slate with respect to some of the inflationary pressures, rather than stop and then let inflation run hot and let the bond vigilantes come in and penalize them on the long end and wreak havoc in the bond markets. This is not the same market that it was when the ECB had the luxury of being at negative rates and just sitting there tight. Outside of the trading floors of Frankfurt, the City of London, Wall Street, <clears throat> trading floors worldwide. If you tune into a show like this, what do you think this sounds like when we start talking about central banks causing recessions? What do you think that actually sounds like? Central it, banks trying to get unemployment to go higher so they can get yeah. inflation lower. It sounds like a political liability and it sounds it's like massive. a conversation that's feasible, maybe, on the peripherals of academic esoteric uh, discussions until there is some greater weakness. We're seeing the earnings roll in, and they continue to show strength, at least around the margins. So if you see that strength, that resilience, it's more feasible to say, OK, we still have perhaps the hopes of a soft landing. Maybe we can get to something where everyone doesn't lose their jobs or a lot of people don't. As you say, as we get further toward that, it gets a lot harder. I think we're here right now. I think central bankers have got to do a much, much better job of explaining all this. For years, I always said it, if you just tuned in and we were talking about bad news being good news, if you were outside of the go. market, that kind of thing drove you nuts. And this kind of thing, I think, drives a lot of people nuts too. This Fed in the news conference next week, if it's not next week and the months after that when unemployment's climbing, if it's climbing, needs to explain why that is a price <laughs> worth paying 
to get inflation lower. And Tom, I think a lot of people are going to struggle with that concept. And that's why politically, this is a real problem. I, politically, as you mentioned earlier, it's about labor. And, and there's been any number of essays out on this. Do the theories that they have work? Richard Clareda with us on the last Fed Day made clear the theories aren't there. I'm going to be controversial here and defend the central banks. Oof. I think, yes, I know. And I'm going to say that they have picked up the slack for fiscal policymakers for many, many years. Now nobody has the ability because we have inflation, well, and that's crimping both of their abilities. And, and now everyone's throwing it at the Fed. So that's what's happening. In support of that, Jean Bovin at BlackRock was heated. This is a supply side analysis, and all of their theories steeped on demand side. Speaking of demand, we were in London for the Queen's funeral, and you know, I was trying to be responsible with my expenses, so I popped up at Liverpool, Liverpool Station. <laughs> Yeah. Liverpool Station, Liverpool the McDonald's Street. there, uh, Liverpool Street. How Excuse much was me. McDonald's? It, it was uh, not as bad as Zurich, because when I when I well, go to yeah, Zurich so and Davos, I want to be responsible ridiculous. there for you know number two value meal. Fifteen dollars. You know, we've been talking here about the anti tech. I know. McDonald's, <laughs> seriously, McDonald's is anti tech as you can get. They've got a, a blended organics revenue in America up six percent, and a, I think they got a blended international up nearly nine percent of sales. They're getting pricing power. Using a smartphone to order McDonald's, Tom. Well, yeah, I was doing that. Are the kids, at, are the kids you know, doing that? Went, no, I was at the Savoy, and, you know, you could, like... You were doing that doing at the Savoy? To, to, yeah, <laughs> Trafalgar <laughs> Square. It's a good luck. I was doing, you know, the, bring the bag in from Trafalgar Square. I can actually... Have the, the ugly American order at the Savoy. Yeah, that would be true. McDonald's coming in on a train. <clears throat> they charged a small stocking fee to bring it up I'm, to the 20th. I'm sure they floor. did. I'm going to whip through the price action. Oh, please, Tom. please. Futures unchanged on the S&P. Going into the ECB a little bit later this morning. Lisa's going to run you through that. That's the equity market on the S&P 500. Need to talk about the bond market too. Yields are higher by seven basis points. Almost close to 4.1%. Need to talk about foreign exchange as well, Tom. The dollar's been weaker. Last few weeks, uh, last few on. sessions, yeah, last finally. week, euro dollar to finally. see it back with a one handle on euro dollar. That's something, Tom. And you see it in Damien Sassar's world as well. EM has pulled back here a little bit from crisis levels. One I mentioned is not as Turkey. That's its own uh, story. Renminbi, 7.24 yuan per dollar. It's a little better, but these are small movements within the continuum sure. of grim EM. Well, I can tell you the dollar biting back this morning. The dollar's stronger right now. Euro dollar negative a half of 1%. Lisa, going into the ECB a little bit later. Yeah, let's see what happens about an hour time when we get the ECB rate decision. 8.15 a.m. 8.45 a.m. is the press conference with Christine Lagarde, the president of the ECB. 8.30 a.m. A bunch of U.S. data, including the first read on the third quarter GDP. Do we start to see some strength come back into the market after two consecutive quarters of declines. Also, initial jobless claims expected to remain near historic lows. And after the bell, Apple and Amazon and Intel all reporting earnings, a massive day of reporting results. How much do we see some sort of confirmation of what we saw from Meta and some of the other tech names that have reported so far, John? Lisa Brambitz, thank you. Sharon Bell joins us now, the European equity strategist at Goldman Sachs. Sharon, I want to start with this call from the ECB. We're looking for 75 basis points. There's a big conversation about maybe a recession taking place. Is that an equity market that you want to own? Yeah, I, I probably not, actually. Um, in the near term, I think European equities have bounced a little bit, um, you know, as per earlier comments um, I heard from Tom, we have seen some of the kind of tail risks related particularly to UK volatility and rate volatility come down. That is great. And I think that's helped with the bounce. But I think more medium term, it's not really a market I'd look to own into a recessionary environment. And we do think there will be a recession next year, along with these tightening rates. Okay, tightening rates in a recession, how does that lead into your guesstimates forward on what I'm going to call a broad European organic revenue growth? Can companies still deliver not 1, 2, 4 percent organic revenue, but can they do better a year, two years out? I, I think actually revenue growth will probably be okay because inflation will probably be staying sticky and high. Um, and companies will pass some of that through, pass some of the cost through. In fact, that's exactly what inflation is, is companies passing some of that cost through. Probably won't be able to pass all of it through. And of course, not only if you've got higher costs coming through, you've also got higher interest rates, you've got higher taxation as well. So uh, I think revenue probably okay, but margins is probably where the squeeze will be. How much are you getting bullish on uh, European banks? And this is sort of the pain trade always, just simply because rates are finally going up and that's what they've been asking for for a long time. Yeah, and I think actually banks, so <coughs> banks are, if I'm talking about a European recession and we are talking about Europe seeing contraction in GDP next year, you would ordinarily say that's dreadful news for the banks. They're domestic, they're levered companies. 
um, and they would obviously be very badly hit if uh, there are, uh, there's a rise in non-performing loans. But I actually think this time around, banks could do a little bit better. Um, interest rates are rising, as you point out, and the last few cycles, interest rates have been very low, often negative in Europe, and that's not the case now. So um, higher interest rates, I think, really helpful for the net interest margins. But also banks themselves have got better capital now um, than they've had in the past. Uh, also, I do think unemployment perhaps will tick up a tiny bit in Europe, but the labour market is pretty strong. Um, so even if you get a, a downturn, a contraction in GDP growth, largely because sort of industrial output supply starts to come down, etc. I think the employment side of things will look a little bit rosier. And for banks, people generally continue to pay their loans, their mortgages, etc., as long as they have jobs. So they will see a squeeze in their real income, so that's going to hit them for sure. But for the banks, what really matters is whether people are still paying off their debt. Now, on the, other, on the flip side, of course, people probably won't take out new loans at higher cost, or they'll try and avoid that. So it's not all rosy for the banks, but I think that relative to previous cycles, yes, I agree, higher rates is helpful. Sharon Unnet, you've said they can be more defensive in this downturn, in this cycle. You and I talked about that last time. Have you seen clients become more receptive to that message? You've seen stocks behave that way? So the banks have outperformed again recently. Well, they've outperformed the bounce recently. They've been outperforming sector year to date. So even though we've seen um, uh, we've seen GDP slide, we've seen, as you mentioned earlier, PMIs in the mid 40s now. You would never have expected banks to have been an outperforming sector into that type of environment. So I do think that shows you you can see banks behave a bit differently this time around. Clients they are naturally sceptical about banks, and I'm. Absolutely, banks tends to be more of a trade than something you want to hold longer term. Um, but I think the fact that they are paying reasonably good dividends and the fact that they do benefit from higher interest rates, results so far look reasonably OK for the banks. That all provides some reassurance. That's true of the whole of Europe, I think, not just the banks over the last 10 years, Sharon. Wonderful to hear yeah, from you, sure. as always. Sharon <laughs> Bell of Goldman Sachs on a financial is going into the ECB a little bit later. TK, I keep saying it because I'm still surprised by it. We're talking about another 75 from the ECB. I, With the data where it is, I get it, double-digit CPI, but the data is pretty weak in Europe right now on the other side I, on output too. I, I just don't get it. I don't get it on a nominal G GDP basis and also a technology overlay. I just Does Lagarde come out and say, OK, we're going to dutifully do 75 beeps and that's it? Does she say that? They're worried about the second round effects, Tom. You know that from oh, the yeah. inflation story. Yes. I, I get it too, and Lisa, they're worried they that this becomes war. even more entrenched because of the supply side dynamic in the energy story. Yeah, and not just that, but also <clears throat> some of the potential supply chain disruptions with respect to China and what's going on there. I mean, there are a lot of issues. This is a nightmare for central banks. It's this stagflationary environment, and that is what they're all facing off with. I think Mohammed called it a quagmire of stagflation. Let's it's like a toxic brew. A toxic I mean, brew. It's a toxic I'll tell you what, that sounds deeply it's depressing, a doesn't it? Well, a quagmire. Quagmire of stagflation. Yeah, stagflation. toxic brew. Nodes of concern. Bramo is becoming more constructive. You notice that, Tom? Nodes of depression. I, 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 a whisper Before she of said optimism. that. <laughs> Jeremy Stretch <laughs> coming up later <laughs> over at CIVC from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The European Central Bank set to lift its main interest rate to the highest in more than a decade. It's trying to, low record, trying to lower record high inflation. Almost all economists surveyed by Bloomberg predict a second straight 75 basis point hike today. President Xi Jinping says China is willing to work with the U.S. to find ways to get along. The comments came before a possible meeting with President Biden next month at a Group of 20 summit. It signals an effort on Xi's part to maintain ties despite disputes over everything from Taiwan chips to the invasion of Ukraine. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is accusing China of undermining the status quo that has kept both nations from going to war over Taiwan. Blinken spoke to Bloomberg in Washington. He said Beijing was trying to speed up its seizure of the island. China and Taiwan downplay the likelihood of an invasion anytime soon. Credit Suisse is planning a sweeping overhaul. It includes a $4.1 billion capital raise, a carve-out of its investment bank, and thousands of job cuts. It's the most urgent attempt yet to repair Credit Suisse after huge losses and management chaos. In breaking up the investment bank, the firm will create a separate advisory and capital markets business that will revive the first Boston branding. And the world's richest man told Twitter employees he does not plan to cut 75% of the staff. 
Bloomberg's learned that Elon Musk denied the numbers in an address to workers at the company's San Francisco office. Still, the billionaire is expected to cut staff when he takes over the company, causing anxiety among workers. The $44 billion deal set to close Friday. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. What's changed is this, a decision by the government in Beijing that that status quo uh, was no longer uh, acceptable, that um, they wanted to speed up the process by which they would pursue reunification. That was Secretary Blinken, Anthony Blinken, sitting down for an audience with Peggy Collins down in DC, TK, Bloomberg's <coughs> very own, very, very cool, just yesterday, an audience with. Do you like that? Yeah. I, I think it's important, and and he's taking obviously the international view. But right now in Washington, based on the zeitgeist I see this morning, it, you know, you click inside two weeks to an election. It's sort of like the United Kingdom. Maybe we're becoming as focused as the United Kingdom becomes focused. You mean we're concentrating things a little we're, bit more? The mind is concentrating for, for both sides. Months. Yeah. Don't we start the presidential race at the start of the year? You guys do it better. That's all, well, it's two years long. Are you just trying to rub it in? No, I'm trying to You're wind him up it. because I know yeah. that he, I know that he finds it yeah. ridiculous. But he could push back and say, "You chose to live in this, so here you go. Two sure, years of I joy. love it here. Oh yeah. You know I do. I'm very thankful for being a guest of this great <clears throat> country. I've said that repeatedly. How's the rent search going? I can talk about the rents in a very <laughs> different fashion. Rents in Manhattan. Nuts. Honestly, Tom, actually explain, insane. Explain the difference between rents here and rents in London. Well, the fee model's ridiculous. The idea that you'd pay one month rent on a 12-month lease as a fee is, is insane. Yeah. And I see a lot more no-fee rentals coming on on Street yes. Easy and Zillow. You yes. see much more of that. But the fact that's still a, a model in, a in New, New York, York is... In New York, I, I just say. think is yes. unreal. Yeah. Foreign to me, Tom, foreign. Personal but I am foreign. So well, yeah, it's okay. Personal it finance be. today on Bloomberg, and we welcome all of you. Yeah, She's familiar right. with the rents across the nation. Emery Horton joins us now, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Emery, I know the territory along the Erie Canal of what was industrialized America. Coming out of the Mohawk River Valley, there was Carrier in Syracuse. There was a company called Kodak in Rochester, and they are gone, gone, gone. The president will visit that shell of industrial America and he will try to paint stark relief within the panic. How panicked is the White House? How panicked is the president? Well, just quickly, to John's point, I think rents in London actually are cheaper. To the president's point today, it's pretty, pretty astonishing. Less than two weeks ago to the midterm elections, they're going to deep blue New York, and he's going to be joined as well with Governor Kathy Hochul, who also had a very contentious debate this week with her Republican challenger. Crime is really becoming a focus in New York. And the Washington Post has a great piece out this morning about talking about the fact that over the last 48 hours, it's become very difficult for the Democrats. They called it a defensive crouch right now. What did you have yesterday? You had the First Lady Jill Biden in Rhode Island. They are really starting to send out these surrogates in places where normally they would have this support already shored up and also advertising campaign in congressional districts in New York and New Jersey. So that really says to me that they are a little bit nervous, not about maybe flipping some seats, but about holding or uh, potentially flipping some of the seats that were held by moderate Republicans that they thought a month ago they would have easily had in the bag. Oh, come on. Dr. Biden's in Rhode Island. Dr. Biden's in Syracuse. You know, whatever. Why are they in the states that are a layup? Well, there's states that laid up because, one, they are nervous, and then, two, some of these other states that are very, very close, neck and neck, you think um, Nevada, where it really does look like Adam Laxholt has a very good chance of winning that seat from the Democrat incumbent, they do not want the president there because many still view these midterm elections. The president would say it's not, but they are, as many view, a referendum on the current administration. So they want to keep a very large, wide distance from the president and some of his surrogates coming out of the White House. And Marie, what is the message that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is among those campaigning for this administration, given that she is currently, I believe, in Ohio, talking about electric vehicles, of all things, and economic development? 
What the administration is going to try to do is point to the legislative wins they've had, and that started back last summer with the hard infrastructure package. The president recently was talking about it today, how with the prior administration, the Trump administration, it was almost a running joke in Washington, D.C., that every week was infrastructure week, and he was able to cross party lines and get that done. And then this summer, of course, they were able to pass what they're calling the, quote, Inflation Reduction Act, but really that has a lot to do with uh, health care and also climate and EV credits and things like that. So she is going to go out and tout that and probably try to make the case that when you have these kinds of bills, whether the U.S. government could then go on behalf of the American people and negotiate your pharmaceutical, with pharmaceutical companies and get drug pricing down, it will help ease inflation. Um, but it'll be interesting because obviously in a place like Ohio, Things like inflation, the economy, these are the number one issues people plan to go out and vote on. Did you watch the president drive cars really fast with Jay Leno AMH last night? I watched about 20 minutes of it. It was The cars were very cool. I'll, I'll say Leno's that. Jay Leno's very cool. I, I Did you watch that, that time? No, I missed There was no mission. The car is cool. Jay Leno is cool. What are you trying to say, John? I didn't say anything. <laughs> Are you trying to get me in trouble this morning? I didn't say anything. You know, I said Jay Leno was the very president, cool. The, the president cool. has a cool Oh, you're corset. asking me if President Joe Biden is cool? Yeah. And Marie, thank you. <laughs> down in PC. You I mean, what do you, what, what do you want me to say to that? What do you want me to say to that? What cars are they driving? I think a 67 <laughs> Corvette or Corvette, something. That was called That's, a pivot, Tom. Yeah. No, I'm <laughs> no it's true. And an old, I think it was an old Ford SUV that had been converted we, into an all-electric or something like that. Can we get back to the election? Oh, no, please. With our team Unless coverage, you want to weigh in on whether the president night. is cool or not. <laughs> no, by all no. means. The president's not cool for Democrats. I'm looking at the map of the giant Greg Giroux, who's brilliant on this. And they're in New York. They're in Rhode Island. They're not on the Giroux maps. That's not where the tension is for his party. It's the usual ones, California, New Mexico, blah, blah, Maine. What's the race oh, you're focused on, Tom? Let's get to it. What's the race you're focused on? I, I think the race I'm focused on is a broader Senate race. I don't have any narrow ones that I really, okay. you know, I, I'm like everybody else. I don't want to be a pundit on this. I, we got the nation's drowning in punditry. Do, does the UK get like They're that? They're drowning in punditry too in the UK. Yeah. I mean, how many little elections have we had over the last few years, Tom? I, Not I general don't. elections, though. <laughs> I, I just, just listened to somebody like Greg Party Jerome. leadership contest, Wasserman to be specific. Yeah. I'll be pundit. I think the Fetterman and Oz uh, debate is going to be the, the debate, uh, but how the outcome of that is going to be really interesting, considering that Fetterman's the incumbent, but it's really sad. I mean, he's recovering I've, I've from a stroke. I found immensely sad as well. I would agree. I found that so, so sad to see him like that. And how does this really represent the Democrats trying to go up against someone who they're painting as extremist with a candidate who's dealing with his own personal issues that are, are pretty, pretty obvious to people in the audience? Really sad, Tom. And no doubt it's going to be a focal point for the next couple of weeks <laughs> as well. In the next couple of hours, we'll catch up with Gene Tenuzzo of Columbia Thread Needle. Looking forward to doing so in the next couple of minutes, actually. And looking at this equity market on the S&P. Futures lift. Futures lift, Tom. Yeah, by a tenth of 1%. Thing. It was up by six yeah, basis Dow's points. Had a good day. That member waiting at the Dow probably helps the Dow out. Yeah, well, and a ton of copper days. helped out. Of course. It's sword fighting. I love this. No, this is well, horrible you know, sword fighting. Best of friends. Uh, Dow has outperformed SPX over the last X Nothing Because that. it's equal. How many people equal, are right? invested in that, eh, Tom? Tons. <laughs> <laughs>
down oh, in rate hikes. No. City we talking well about a step down too. Yeah. Ed and Zetner's talking about that as well. I think most people on board with this idea that you get 75, you come down to 50 and maybe 25 after that. <laughs> That's what Ed and Zetner and Morgan Stanley are talking about this morning. Holland Horst at City said this. <laughs> I love this. If anything, we see hawkish risk as officials will look to avoid a re-loosening of financial conditions. And that's the interesting point from the team over at City, Tom. How do you do that on Bloomberg Surveillance, folks? You go to the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which shows you a Holland Horse-like number. John, negative 1.06, make that one standard deviation, and that is more accommodative than where it was 10 days ago. I want to finish on the euro just briefly and look at euro dollar going into the ECB, looking for a 75 basis point hike. 8.15 Eastern time <clears throat> is when we get that decision. And oppressors win. About 30 minutes after 30, that time. Euro dollar negative a third of 1%. And I was just looking at Italian German spreads, the 10 year Italy the Italian trading story. 222 basis points over Germany on a 10 year maturity, the wide to the year 252. So we've come in, but I think that's probably still an uncomfortable level, Tom, for a lot of people in Europe at about 220 ish. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to see. I, I stepped on, don't get me going. Step down. I, I, don't, I don't like it. It's just. Come on, what, it's what just, don't, what don't it's you just like slow down it? on a rate of change. It's just another okay. marketing thing. Where did it come from? Who do we blame? <laughs> Who do you want to blame? McKee? I mean, I mean I've mean, been saying it. Invent this? I can't remember where I got it. I think Jim Bianco maybe said it out on Twitter as well. I think others at Morgan Stanley have said it this morning. City sank it. Would you like to rebrand it? We can rebrand it if you want. It's a change of the rate of change. It's just call it a Newtonian move. You know, okay. Something everyone that, that would works, understand. That works fantastic that on works the south side, Tom. <laughs> Lisa, what do you make of that? A Newtonian move. You can open that one. <laughs> Happy meal and rates. I don't know. I will say a slowdown is not a pivot. That's the Holland Horst view uh, this morning, nice. which is, you know, and then he uses step down, but in quotes, because he doesn't want to take responsibility for it. I know we could have, an, um, have him on and hopefully rebrand it. When you were talking, uh, John, about some of the tech names, I, I want to dig into some of the scope of the moves that we have seen. I mean, just based on Google or Alphabet, as the parent company is called, and Microsoft, those shares both suffer the biggest sell off going back to March of 2020 yesterday. They are still down to Day. So it didn't necessarily free up valuations for people who really don't want to catch a falling knife. And meta platforms, I mean, this is just amazing to me. There was a really smart comment on Twitter, a, a viewer saying, today's meta is tomorrow's MySpace. How much is that right now, the feeling in markets with shares lower by 23% after already falling I dramatically, like more than 60% and to the lowest level since 2018? Like an old museum that no one visits anymore. Is that what MySpace is? is that, that's what MySpace is, isn't it? <laughs> like an old museum. But aren't the pages still there or were still there? I never had a MySpace Exactly. Page. I don't know if they're still yeah, there exactly. because it's an old museum that I've not visited we'll for a long time. We'll have to dig up the archaeological uh, evidence and we'll <laughs> share that with you if we can get it later. In the meantime, we are looking ahead to what's going to happen after the bell uh, with Amazon and Apple and Intel. And I put Intel in there because that's also the microcosm of the bigger story behind the chip sector. How much is Apple really going to be <clears throat> the true bellwether? If they're able to be resilient, does that highlight that this is specific stories, Tom, and not necessarily just some sort yeah. of broad-based retrenchment from the tech world in general? Same on Amazon as well, folks. You're going to have some mystery there of how Prime Days or Days Plural uh, did for Amazon. And the last mile of the cardboard box business seems to be a bit of a challenge as well. Right now, Gene Chinuzo, Global Head of Fixed Income at Columbia Threadneedle, with a very smart note encompassing all the econobabble. And Gene, I want to bring it right over to the numbers we're going to see today. What does the Fed do with buoyant U.S. GDP? Recession this, recession that. I'm looking at a 2.4% statistic to see at 8.30 in one hour this morning. Tom, I think it's difficult to call U.S. GDP buoyant when it's been negative for the first half of the year. And we can blame that on you know, different Fair. factors that are not related to the consumer. But I think it, it, this is actually a requirement if the Fed still has any chance of a soft landing to get some semblance of positive GDP for the third quarter. Jamie, we get so much put back against this uh, step down term. Duncan on Twitter, <laughs> I think the best term is to slow the pace of rather than Thank step you. down. Do you like that, Tom? Like Just slow that. the pace of yeah, interest rate time. hikes. Gene, isn't that decision ultimately going to be at the mercy of the next CPI print in November going into the December meeting? It sure is. I think we are getting closer to that point where the Fed can decelerate its pace of hikes, but we're not there yet. And we've seen that the Fed has a pattern of looking at that most recent CPI print. And that last one was sufficiently hot that, you know, 75 basis points still needs to be the base case for next week's meeting. But I think as we go later in the year, there can be ample justification for them to slow down that pace. 
And I do think that's a meaningful signal because that reduces interest rate volatility and interest rate volatility has been at the center of financial market weakness this year. So, you know, I think that that is going to be a critical step, even if it's not the end of this tightening cycle. How concerned are you, Gene, about the bond vigilantes coming back in the United States in a way, particularly for 10 year and 30 year denominations, if there is some sort of step down, if there is a slowdown in the pace of rate hikes, even in the face of CPI that still is coming in hot? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I, I'm not that worried about it. I don't think it's a market that has the same vulnerabilities, for example, as we saw in the UK market, where very thin liquidity and some leveraged players at the long end of the curve could really drive those prices and yields to significantly higher levels in a short period of time. I think those dynamics are different. The risk case for the long end of the US curve is if you know, we really start to see aggressive selling in a scenario, for example, where Japan ends their yield curve control. Um, but I still think that's an outside case. And I think for the US, the idea of the bond vigilantes coming back, well, it's real, but I mean, haven't we seen it this year already? So do you think that there's already evidence and enough evidence uh, that there is some sort of slowdown in the pace of inflation with AutoNation this morning, for example, coming out and really confirming this view of used car prices coming down? And there's feeling that there's limited pricing power for an increasing number of U.S. companies. Is all, all bleeding into this feeling that perhaps people have gotten a little carried away with some of their inflation projections that naturally it will come down a bit more? I think that's the most important question in markets today. I think there is ample evidence that there is lower inflation in the pipeline, but it's not in the headline figures yet. And I don't think the Fed is prepared to blink when they're barely over their neutral policy rate estimate and inflation at a headline level is still high. So it's coming. We feel like there's a broadening amount of data that support that, whether it be in used car prices, as you suggested, whether it be ISM prices paid, measures from the you know, National Federation of Independent Businesses and a variety of other things. But it will take just a little bit more time. Gene, final question then. 10 year last week on Friday, I believe, was at 433. Right now, the 10 year at 4.06 percent. The two year right now at 444 on Friday at 463. Just want to get a feel from the conversations that you've been having with your colleagues and perhaps clients as well. Do you believe that might have been the high on Friday or do you think we're still threatening to break beyond and above those kind of levels? Uh, you know, we'll continue to press so long as the Fed is aggr is aggressively hiking in these 70 basis, 75 basis point increments. And we're likely to have the three biggest central banks hiking in that magnitude, you know, within the next week. But I don't think we're far away from that hike or that, that peak, John. And, and I don't know if we just saw it last week or if we're going to see it in the next few weeks. But, you know, if we plan for our clients over 12 months or beyond, I think these are better. This is a better environment to be adding duration to portfolios, quite frankly. Gene, thank you, sir. As always, good to catch up, buddy. Gene Tanuta there of Columbia Threadneedle. Thank you very much. Tom, that seems to be the take from a lot of people that after the 75 at the next week's meeting from this Federal Reserve, we've seen the bulk of well, the hiking cycle. And you can think about leaning into a bit of duration. I hear that a lot from a lot of people. Yeah, I'm hearing it too. When's the inflation report, John, you're focused on? November 10th, I believe. There is. That's what matters, November 10th. Read of the day. Peter Bookvar, we protect the copyright of our guest, Peter Bookvar, over at Bleakley Advisory. John, I talked about this yesterday to uh, someone I ran into on the street. We're not talking about the redo in floating rate paper and in commercial real estate. Everything's about 30-year mortgage. That's sure. what sells on TV. I get that. He brilliantly walks through that transaction of two years ago. It's a three-year piece of paper, multifamily housing, and what happens a year from now? And the math doesn't work. You know who is talking Simple about that. it? She's sitting next to me. I know. The math <laughs> Bramo, doesn't work. Bramo Bramo just it nails it. Absolutely nails it. You know, it doesn't really matter. I, it just going forward, though, I think that there is this bigger <clears throat> question of how much inflation already is coming down. You know, and you ask about what you look for. It's not going to show up in the CPI reports because it is going to crimp some of the housing demand. We've already seen this, but it isn't going to show up for another year. So how much do you start to feel this subtle feeling, not of transitory, but that the inflation is going to cool a lot faster? And that's what I'm hearing Different from the parts, likes of Peter Cheer. Yes, and housing, that's what we just heard uh, just there. Do we, do we think we're going to see a, a substantial disinflation in rents or in home ownership costs? Well, how are you measuring it? In the official it, CPI exactly. print? No. You're not. I mean, it's, no. it's a distortion. But the answer, and, and we're infected by New York. And I went below 59th Street yesterday, John. Is this where you had a conversation? I was shocked. About? 
He had what to. Did, what did you see? There's a bridge down there, Brooklyn Bridge. I went right by it. It was gorgeous. We're on 58th. How'd you get into the building? I, I had to figure it out, you know. The only way I knew was the McDonald's was around the corner. So I, I saw that. I thought that was on 57th. That's on 3rd Avenue. I went below Between 59th 57th Street. and 50, 58th. Yeah. I don't think rents are... Nas good nationwide, That's rents good are going to disinflate. Are you kidding me? That doesn't happen usually. They're not going to yeah. disinflate, but the pressure goes off a little I'm bit. I'm still surprised you actually had a conversation with someone you met on the street. Well, yeah. Usually, you, know, you usually ignore them security. and you're really rude uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm and polite. Security pushes them away. I'm polite yeah. and you shout out, get a life or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Special <laughs> I mean, True story. I know. True story. I know. Get a life. And I'm just sitting there like, thank you so much for watching. <laughs> <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. Tom Keen, keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. The European Central Bank set to look past growing fears of a recession today. It's expected to raise interest rates by 75 basis points for the second time in a row. The ECB is trying to quell inflation that's running at almost 10 percent, five times the ECB's medium target. The Biden administration been forced to scale back a plan to impose a cap on Russian oil prices. That follows skepticism by investors and growing risk in financial markets. Instead of strangling the Kremlin's oil revenues by imposing a strict lid on prices, the U.S. and EU are likely to settle for a more loosely policied cap at a higher price than once envisioned. It's Credit Suisse's most dramatic steps yet to repair the bank. It plans a $4.1 billion capital raise, a carve-out of its investment bank and thousands of job cuts. We spoke with Credit Suisse's CEO. We want to go through the transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation also with a very strong capital base. It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. Credit Suisse is trying to restore credibility after a succession of big losses and management chaos. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Also have to be uh, to responsibly manage an increasingly intense competition with China. You know, we have to maintain our military advantage, but we're making it clear that we don't see conflict. I told them that we're looking for competition. There'll be st st stiff competition, but not it doesn't need to be conflict. The president of the United States on the relationship with China, live from New York, counting you down to an ECB rate decision about 30 minutes from now with equity futures slightly negative on the S&P 500. Have to say, no real drama here on the S&P. Drama elsewhere, though. Meta down by 22%, 22.6% in and around session lows. Credit Suisse down about 12.5%. So, Tom, drama at the single name level this morning and a little bit well, later this afternoon you hear from Apple you hear from Amazon as well yeah and I don't want to waste a lot of time here John we got Greg Villier coming up but but I'm going to point out that my theme for next year is the great zombie roll-up and maybe that starts with Credit Suisse today doing its own interior roll-up which is the zombie piece the piece that gets they have a bad bank they're setting off, up a formal it... to their credit they said look we're going to do the bad bank accounting and they're going to throw part of that's going to go to Apollo Pimco blah 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 talk from Reuters of this IPO of the Credit Suisse first Boston <clears throat> minute, Tom. Can you talk to us about that, the heritage of First Boston to make uh, a comeback? It, to, to fossils, of which there are 12 left on Wall Street, it is a magical name. There's no question the romance of it, and it's it's literally out of Mad Men. It's literally, I mean, you got to go back to the 50s and the 60s. Okay, they're going to market it, they're going to brand it, but what I would suggest people want to see is results. Sure. That's what they And can we just say we all know some brilliant people at Credit Suisse, and I'm sure this morning's. Yes. It's pretty tough, yep. isn't it, yep. when your company goes through this time? And one of the first people to get behind me in the act I'm doing, folks, is Neil Soss, head of research for years uh, in economics at Credit Suisse. Right now, also behind us is Greg Vallier with the must-read note from AGF Investments, and he joins us this morning. Greg, I said to them, I said, get somebody who remembers driving by the GE factory in Schenectady, New York, on your way past Utica, there's only one guy we know that remembers Jack Welch's Schenectady, New York. It's gone. 
Greg, maybe yeah. it's the Uticas of America. They're going to go to Syracuse today. Dr. Biden went to Providence as, as well. Can the Democrats garner votes in the many Utica New Yorks of America? Well, ironically, it looks like Democrats who have been entrenched in New England are in trouble. So, no, I, I think we're seeing a total reversal. We're seeing Hispanic voters leave the Democratic Party, go into Republicans. We're seeing a, a lot of changes from the old uh, the old rules. And Lisa, what I think is so important here is, is this just simple idea of the panic two weeks into the election. And what we're going to see day to day here is going to be extraordinary. Well, and if you look at some of the uh, betting odds, you can see that the Democrats are just dramatically losing seats. And there's a question of how bad of a whopping they're going to take in both the House and the Senate. Greg, from res <laughs> with respect to which races you're watching, what's going to be most telling to you in terms of not just whether the Democrats lose power, but by how much? Yeah, I'm at 17 in the House, and I'm probably on the low side. I might have to revise my final forecast and put it up into the 20s. Uh, so many so many interesting uh, dynamics in this election. Polls show that crime has surged is a big issue. Polls show that abortion is not as big an issue as we thought it might be. Uh, polls also show Hispanic voters are moving to the Republicans. Really interesting stuff. And I do think there's going to be a wicked, wicked postmortem among the Democrats trying to figure out just what happened. And not to be conspiracy theorist, but I have to go to this because there have been some rumblings around the edges. How concerned are you about election security at a time when it's clear that there are a number of international actors, uh, as well as domestic yeah. ones, that want to raise doubts about the institution of the United States? It's a legitimate fear. Uh, there was a break in yesterday. We don't know the details, so we can't really speculate. But I have a hunch that's probably not the only incident we'll have in the next two weeks like that. Right. Charges of ba ballot box stuffing, you know, all of that stuff. Greg, a real focus on the Democrats here. Let's focus on the GOP right now. How grand old party is the GOP two weeks out? Well, they've got an internal debate to resolve, and that is how much money do we give Ukraine? Uh, Kevin McCarthy has had to walk back what he said. I think most Republicans want to continue the funding. Right. I, I would make... Mm -hmm. Please, go ahead. I'm sorry. Please. I'd make this point, Tom. I think this, one of the sleeper issues, and it involves China, it involves Ukraine, it involves Iran, is a dramatic increase in defense spending. I think we go to $800 billion in this new fiscal year. Are Democrats and Republicans on board with that jointly, as we see them both jointly with a view on China? One of the rare issues where you could see a compromise. I think there's unified antipathy in Washington toward China for all, all of the things that they've done, with whether it's COVID or treatment of dissidents. Greg, let's say that the uh, Republicans do win both the House and the Senate. What are they going to do with the Fed when they are hiking rates? How much are they going to start pushing back against a uh, pretty aggressive tightening in some of the monetary policies simply because it's going to create some real problems for this economy? Fearless forecast, Lisa. I think we're going to start to see the Fed really come under intense criticism. We saw yesterday Sherrod Brown, the re Democrat from Ohio, with a pretty harsh letter. And we see people in the markets, whether it's Jeremy Siegel or Jim Paulson, there are a lot of highly regarded people who feel the Fed has overdone it. I think that criticism is going to increase. Great to catch up, Greg. Just awesome. No doubt we'll speak to you. Touch base again okay. before the midterms. Greg Valier of AGF Investments. Tom, within two weeks now to that vote, yeah, to the result of those votes. We're going to have a lot of coverage of this and do it in a Bloomberg surveillance way, which I think is to fold in the, the you know, the polling and that, like what Valier uh, lives in, but as he does as well, fold it into the economics. For the one thing I will say is there's a huge certitude that with uh, gridlock or even Republican ascendancy, tax increases vapor. Yep. Vapor. He mentioned Vegas. China there just briefly. You know, something we haven't talked about because <clears throat> it's a busy day. I get that. The Chancellor of Germany, Schultz, Tom, have you seen this story? The German government has agreed on a compromise which will allow Chinese state-owned shipping conglomerate Costco to buy a 24.9% yeah. stake in one of Hamburg's port terminals. And Americans are clueless on this. There's a huge relationship there. There's a this real is not tension What's it here. called? Belt and suspenders? What's the... Th Theory. I think you mean Belt and Road. Belt and Road, that's about? it, yeah. I'm not sure it's called Belt It's not Ger and Germany, it's, you know, it's, where, it's a different relationship. <laughs> where on earth <laughs> you have you got that from? I have Belt no idea. Spenders. I have no idea. From can we talk about sure something? There's a real concern can we, over this. Can we go sensitive yeah, now? Yes. You know, Lisa and I, we have a foreigner with us, but I think we're going to bring this up because <laughs> nobody else in the media is.
I don't find it John, beautiful. I mean, <clears throat> John, seriously, I'm going to bring this up now, folks. Go and ahead. This is delicate. Afterthought is in school right now and in a religion class. They're studying Hindu. This is momentous in your United Kingdom, this new prime minister. Sure. And there's people in America where it's lost in translation the difference of the history of the United Kingdom and religion versus America in that. Explain it, what it means for most of the United Kingdom or all. There's some idiots out there. There's always but some explain idiots. explain what it means. No, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I think we've talked a lot about the diversity <clears throat> of the Conservative Party in terms of the makeup of who leads Unthinkable in America. the party yeah. and the makeup of the, the Chancellor. Mr. Cleverly staying as foreign Quartin, minister. Whatever you think, that was yeah. an historic decision by Liz Truss as well. And Tom, for me, I think the controversy is not going to be around that stuff. I'm happy to say. Right. I think the nice. controversy is going to be about a very rich, wealthy individual, a billionaire through marriage, going and, through with austerity in the United the, Kingdom and cost of living right. crisis. And the process to get here, is that a part of it as well? Sure. Okay. From New York I, City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. Investors are obviously skittish as the Fed pulls away the punch bowl of easy money. I do think the risk is that they end up doing more than what they've already signaled in the dots plot. They're going to stick with tightening, at least for the Fed. Yes, other central banks are hiking, but they're also beginning to slow down. I think we've already done too much, and we've set a chain reaction in motion that is going to lead us to real problems later this winter. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen. An eventful Thursday. Much going on, including in 15 minutes, Christine Lagarde and the ECB will report. And then on to the press conference. John, what will you listen for in the Lagarde press conference? The tone around the economy, the balance of risks as well, and the conversation, Tom, around the balance sheet. They're willing to hike 75 basis points potentially into a recession. Are they willing to unwind that balance sheet into right. the financial instability that we've seen through bond markets over the last month? In the intro, they talk about the punch bowl. I don't believe there's a punch bowl in Frankfurt. I think it's so messed up. It's not anything conventional. What's the difference in Lagarde balance sheet versus Powell's balance sheet. Powell doesn't have Italy on its balance sheet. Without a doubt, that is the biggest difference. Without a doubt, Tom. And that's the problem with Europe and the bond buying program. You've got so many different countries, so many different bond markets just sitting there. Individual facing very, bond what was facing the, what very, was, very different situations. What was the thing that was like eight months ago, seven months ago, out of an ECB meeting, they were going to do a plan? Um, they were going to do an individual bond plan where they summed it up. And TPI? Put it in, t yeah. You're talking about TPI, the Transmission Protection That's Instrument. it, the transmission. I forgot that. That was the contained spreads. Where are we on the TPI that, that this TPI morning? TPI hasn't been activated. TPI is meant to work like OMT. Do you remember OMT? I remember OMT. Klaus Regling is one of my favorites on this. Draghi came up with OMT, OMT outright monetary TPI. transactions. That was that great whatever it takes moment yeah. in 2012. OMT was never activated. <clears throat> OMT. And OMT was Lisa, very effective. The one that was better than any of them was E I E I O. That was so, <laughs> OMT. So good. I mean, Lisa, yeah. this you is can what laugh. One of us had to learn all this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Oh, McDonald's. Right. He was American. <laughs> lived in Kentucky. I mean, Lisa, come on. It's alphabet soup yeah. of people making it up as they go. Trying to offset some of the financial uh, stability concerns as well as some of the just social concerns in a place like the European Union while also combating inflation. Is it an impossible task? And ultimately, how much is inflation going to cooperate? And that, I think, is really the underpinning right. of the bulls and the bears. The bulls think that you're starting to see, the bulls for the market, not necessarily the economy, think that inflation is starting to roll over a little bit faster well, than people okay. think. And the bears say, this is a structurally higher inflationary regime that you're going to see the bond vigilantes and the currency vigilantes come out in force. My surveillance correction of the month, John, was the head of the Dutch Central Bank leaning over in the middle of the interview and saying, hey, say? stupid, inflation in the Netherlands is not 11%, it's 17%. But is that 17% old news? Well, let's talk about the Eurozone at the moment. Double-digit <clears throat> CPI, so 10%. We'll get some right. inflation data a little bit later this week. Can you say we've seen the peak in Eurozone inflation? I think a lot of people on court, Tom, are not comfortable mm -hmm. with that call just yet. And that's the problem the ECB has. This was always going to be the dilemma. It was the classic EM dilemma for these central banks in DM. A dilemma, Tom, they haven't faced right. for a long, long time. That's upside risk to inflation and downside risk to growth. 
And they've got a preference here, and that's to attack inflation. And that's the mandate of the CCB. Lisa, what do bonds say? They're the price, they're the thermometer of the system. I mean, parity on Euro, but what do bonds say in Europe, and how do you roll that over to America? <laughs> My favorite thing is that bonds are trading like Bitcoin. I mean, not quite not quite like that in uh, in Europe, but you have seen bond yields get tempered a bit. And I wonder how mm. much the Bank of the Canada decision yesterday, where they came right. in with a smaller rate hike, how much that's going to end up setting the tone for central banks around the world, that they can step down, Tom. Let's get to the data right now and step down to a red and green on the screen. John, I'm going to go the more industrial, the bigger, the uglier names like the Dow Jones Industrial Average have a lift the last number of days versus a NASDAQ flat on its back. Flat on its back because the likes of Alphabet was down 9%. And Meta. And Microsoft yeah. was down 7 or 8 And Meta this morning, you want to know where Facebook is? Facebook's down almost 23%. Which is worse than two hours ago. The trend's in the wrong and direction. And it's getting worse right now. Euro dollar is negative 4 tenths of 1%. Dollar making a little bit of a comeback. Some dollar strength going into the ECB, that decision, 11 minutes away, and yields are higher <clears throat> on a 10-year in America, Tom, up by seven basis points to 4.07%. Stay with us on Credit Suisse through the morning as well, a reorganization at the beleaguered Swiss bank. Right now, Jeremy Stretch joins to get you out 12 minutes to the ECB decision ahead of G10FX at CIBC. Jeremy, what will you watch for in 10 minutes? Well, you're absolutely right. You've just been previewing it and I've just been listening to your comments. Well, clearly, it's very much about the decision itself in terms of that assumption that 75 basis points is baked in. Even the dubs have uh, seemingly acquiesced to that view. But of course, there is still a small residual risk that the ECB doesn't follow through, but it seems most likely. But more so, it will be very much that language regarding the uh, forward looking bias towards the growth trajectory, uh, any adjustments in terms of the balance sheet. And also in terms of the TL true position, in terms of the potential arbitrage between the higher deposit rate and those TL true rates, uh, and whether that is going to see a, a gradual, a graduated degree of liquidity reduction in the eurozone, which I think could well be quite instructive for uh, euro valuations going forward. So, Jeremy, three issues, the rate hike, the balance sheet and Taltro's. Let's talk about the balance sheet just a little bit more on the prospect of QT. They're willing to hike into recession risk. Do you think they're willing to do QT into financial instability that we've experienced in the last month or so? I think they're starting to debate or at least discuss QT, but I think we're still some way away from actually getting towards any degree of even passive QT as far as the ECB is concerned. So if we are and when we see this uh, process starting to be underway, then it will be most likely be that passive nature, so no longer re reinvesting all of the uh, maturing proceeds. But I think that's still very much a story for well into 2023. I think the uh, ECB and the bank would be much happier to at the very least get rates back towards uh, some degree of neutrality uh, before they start to consider the balance sheet adjustment. And that, that neutrality in terms of uh, the ECB is probably somewhere in the region of two to two and a quarter percent. So even if we do 75 basis points today, we have some way to go. So I think uh, QT is probably still a story for 2023 rather than 2022. Jeremy, we've been looking at bond yields in the German region throughout the euro region. They had been coming down just a bit before today, and they are pairing uh, some of the gains on price and rise in yield. How much have we baked in the idea of a slowdown in the pace of rates that's material after a 75 basis point rate hike in about 10 minutes, nine minutes time? Yes, I think that's very much what uh, the market is predicated upon, that if we are going to see 75 base points today, to follow on from the uh, previous uh, move of that magnitude, the market is very much anticipating that the ECB will be quite, uh, not quite so um, aggressive in terms of its policy perspective going forward. So we at CIBC would expect a uh, 50 basis point move in December, uh, and then ultimately probably a 25 basis point move most likely into the beginning of uh, 2023. But at that time, I think we are getting to a scenario where the uh, rolling over of inflation will prove to be a little more substantive, a little more durable. And at the same time, we see those headwinds in terms of the macro backdrop playing out. And I think that will have an impact in terms of the ECB's reaction function, such that I think they will struggle to meet what is currently priced into the OIS curve for uh, 2023. If the ECB pulls back a little bit and signals that they are open to just a 25 basis point rate hike in December, is that bullish or bearish for the euro? <clears throat> Well, that's a very good question because clearly uh, markets, as I say, are, are priced in a reasonably aggressive uh, scenario. Now, no, normally Economics 101 would argue that a lower rate hike uh, would be detrimental to a currency. But I think in a backdrop where you are seeing uh, macroeconomic headwinds and we have already seen some uh, fairly substantive uh, policy tightening from the ECB, I think actually rather, uh, you know, rather unusually it may well prove to be a little more, uh, uh, a little more supportive, so providing a little more of a tailwind to growth and perhaps also reducing or pre precluding 
uh, some of those uh, fragmentation risks from becoming uh, even more amplified as we run into year end. Jeremy, it's the last decade in reverse. In the last decade, we had a cohort of Germans complaining about the easing of the ECB. And now you hear from the Italian Prime Minister complaining about the tightening of the ECB. Jeremy, the politicisation of this European Central Bank, is that something they can handle as an institution? Are they resilient? Does it damage the signalling that comes from the ECB? What do you make of it all? Well, you're absolutely right. I think, in a sense, that does underline the difficulties that the European monetary uh, system has uh, relative to the Fed. And that was, I, I noted when you were talking uh, before, you, before you came to me regarding the difference between the balance sheet of the ECB and the Fed. Well, clearly, uh, that politicization and the differential positions and the political backdrops across the Eurozone do make the job of the ECB incredibly difficult. And, of course, you then throw into those uh, fragmentation risks. So we are seeing increasing degrees and probably will see increasing degrees of criticism on both sides of the uh, equation in terms of the policy backdrop from the ECB, whether it's uh, too aggressive a tightening in the context of, say, somewhere like Italy, and perhaps some of those uh, northern Europeans and Nordic countries where uh, inflation has been very elevated for a protracted period of time, arguing that the ECB is still being uh, rather too lax in its policy. And that really underlines the difficulties that uh, the ECB has, and that's probably why having somebody who has a very strong political backdrop uh, background at the top of the ECB is perhaps uh, quite useful beyond uh, any uncertainties that you have that Lagarde is not a trained economist. Hey, Jeremy, thank you. We're going to build on that in a moment. Jeremy Stretch there of CIBC is going to stick with us into the ECB decision. Everyone seemingly wants a weaker currency, or rather they want the US to have a weaker currency specifically. They want a weaker dollar. MasterCard sees the fourth quarter adjusted growth impact, Tom, 6 to 7% by FX. We have seen a lot of that over the last couple of weeks. Some volatility there in the stock trades off. It's down, I believe, 4% here. Not all that much given the last number of days surge. But, you know, the new 3 to 4% is 6 to 7% by foreign exchange. And to, to everybody's conversation here, when's the win of dollar weakness? Everybody's gotten old and gray waiting for dollar weakness. It's well, not We're happening. waiting for it at the ECB as well, to fold it into that conversation. Elisa, yeah. President Lagarde, I'm sure, would love to see a weaker dollar. Yeah, but at what point does this start to actually feed into U.S. economic growth? Because we're seeing these companies see uh, margins crimped as a result of some of the FX headwinds. At what point does it become the U.S. problem where they're incentivized to actually do something about it? I don't know. I mean, people are saying not yet. You're still seeing uh, earnings continue to perform. Can I just say 99 handle on Facebook, Tom? 99. Wow. 99. Wow, just dropping Do you like know when stone. that was in the middle of 2021? The board? Where's the board? 387. Of it's nuts. And it's, it's, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a private company masquerading as a public company. Is that too harsh? I think you could say a lot that, harsher than is that. That same that Zuckerberg. <laughs> I, I don't, Stocks down 23.5%. Brutal. ECP rate decision coming up from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In just a few minutes, the European Central Bank is likely to lift its main interest rate to the highest in more than a decade. It's trying to lower record high inflation. Almost all economists surveyed by Bloomberg predict a second straight 75 basis point hike today. President Xi Jinping says China is willing to work with the U.S. to find ways to get along. The comments came before a possible meeting with President Biden next month at a group of 20 summit. It signals an effort on Xi's part to maintain ties despite disputes over everything from Taiwan to chips to the invasion of Ukraine. Credit Suisse is planning a sweeping overhaul. It includes a 4.1 billion capital raise, a carve out of its investment bank and thousands of job cuts. It's the most urgent attempt yet to repair Credit Suisse after huge losses and management chaos. In breaking up the investment bank, the firm will create a separate advisory and capital markets business that will revive the first Boston branding. In Singapore, the head of the central bank says Southeast Asia has done a decent job of allowing markets to absorb some of the shocks from the surging U.S. dollar. Ravi Menon spoke with Bloomberg. A whole lot of things can happen when the exchange rate moves too fast, too far, too far. Um, but I think so far they've been managing it well. Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines and Malaysia are all struggling with more than 8% depreciation in their currencies this year. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
Because if you compare the development of the um, euro towards uh, the US dollar, you see a certain decline. And uh, therefore, and that, that might, might also, uh, in the end, um, of course, make imports more expensive and import inflation. So I think the ECB has all these things in mind. It acts pretty much in line with what other central banks are currently doing. The German Deputy Finance Minister seems to be happy with the ECB, which is a change from the last 10 years, because this time the ECB is hiking interest rates, it's not cutting, and it's going to cease end bond buying and maybe execute QT. That decision's about 50 seconds away, Tom, and going into it, we have a weaker euro, euro dollar, still just above parity, euro dollar on the session, down a half of 1%. That was clearly the tone I had in Washington with Axel Weber, is the vector here of ECB is calming to the Netherlands. Into Germany. They're as happier well. with this They're trajectory, just, Tom. They begin the morning happier. Well, Lisa, I said it was the last 10 years in reverse because it was the Germans complaining about policy being too loose. And now you've got the Italians who predictably, with a new prime minister, are going to complain about things becoming too tight too quickly. Yeah, well, they also have a different uh, leg right now because Germany has been on the front foot of, I don't want to say the offending uh, camp here, but part of the issue in terms of what's been going on and the dependence on Russian oil and all of that. So how much uh, is there a bit of, hey, we need to throw you a bone in order to stay part of the union, which is the reason why there might be more willingness by the ECB to close spread and to try to help You're some of the borrowing costs. You're being far too kind. That is the weak link in the economy right now, without a doubt. That decision has just dropped. 75 basis points was the previous number. We got 150 on the depot rate, so we go from 75 to 150 on the depot rate, in line with expectations. On the marginal lending facility, from 150 to 225. On the main refinancing rate, from 125 <clears> to 2%. So all slap bang in line with what we expected. Going into it, you had a week of euro, euro dollar down about a half of 1%. That's where it stays right now. Starts to roll over just a little bit more. I'll get into the additional headlines in just a moment. Yields in Italy were higher on a 10-year. They stay higher up by about 10 or 11 basis points on a 10-year to 441. As you'd expect, Lisa, the ECB expects to raise interest rates further from here. You know, it's interesting to see that euro weakness uh, just sort of accelerates throughout the session after these headlines. I'm watching right now 1.0013% uh, uh, per dollar. How much can we get this sort of sense uh, that the outlook is deteriorating? And that's sort of what I'm looking for in some of the comments that we hear with inflation staying above the target for an extended period of time seeming to suggest ongoing hikes going forward. Just pulling up the statement quickly, Tom, for anyone following the asset purchase program at the ECB, PEP and all those other acronyms, here's the quote for you. The governing council, you're laughing, the governing council intends to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing, maturing securities purchased under the APP for an extended period of time past the date when it started raising the key ECB interest rates and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain ample liquidity conditions and an appropriate monetary policy stance. As concerns the PEPP, PEP, Tom, <laughs> Pandemic Emergency Purchase I'm Program. Sorry. Let me complete it. I'll get through it. The Governing Council intends to reinvest the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the program until at least the end of 24. In any case, the future roll-off of the PEP portfolio will be managed to avoid interference with the appropriate monetary policy stance. The Governing Council, Tom, will continue applying flexibility in reinvesting redemptions coming due in the PEP portfolio with a view to countering risk to the monetary policy transmission mechanism well, related to the pandemic. Was that enough monetary policy speak, Tom, in a couple of only paragraphs? You know, you can do it, John. I could never do that. It was very, no very impressive. Listening. What I would suggest here, is anyone, John... Is anyone out there? No, no one's out John, there right now. Yeah, exactly. You know, on Bloomberg Radio, 47 people drew, uh, turned their radio off on I-80. Um, what I would suggest here is two <laughs> things. One, how different these headlines are as a set from what we see at 2 p.m. for the United States Central Bank. But the other thing missing here is the draggy confidence of a timeline out one year? A time I don't see 2023, uh, who's 2024. About right now, Tom. It, it, the the draggy timeline headlines have disappeared. So we got the 75 from the ECB. I gave you the balance sheet unwind talk. You nailed it. Uh, am I allowed to do the Taltro stuff, or would you like me to avoid it? I, shall I shall I avoid the Taltro stuff? No. I'm going to bring you the Taltro stuff, okay? The <laughs> governing council decided to change the terms and conditions of the decision. third series <laughs> of targeted long-term refinancing operations. During the acute phase of the pandemic, this instrument played a key role in countering downside risk to price stability. Today, in view of the unexpected and extraordinary rise in inflation, it needs to be recalibrated to ensure that it's consistent with the broader okay. monetary policy normalisation process and to reinforce the transmission of policy rates increases to bank lending conditions. Leads to the final word here. The Governing Council therefore decided to adjust the interest rates applicable to Teltro 3 from the 23rd of November 22 okay. to offer banks additional voluntary early repayment 
Okay, right. so hold on a second. This, it's like English words that are not English, right, put together. Well, none of it is. But okay, so that's what, <laughs> that's what Central Bank Speak maybe is. To translate, how much are some of these cheap loans? I was actually just reading up on this sure. because I didn't really understand it. How much are these cheap loans uh, is sort of a problem for an ECB that wants to tighten conditions for banks? So they're saying you can pay them down now, get them off your books, or we're going to raise rates on you. Is that right? I'm not sure the banks are going to be happy with this. But yeah. That's the smallest you know of what violence. The we have with all this alphabet <laughs> soup. What's that? Someone who speaks 14 languages. Maria today. Maria's just Maria's going to translate she this, speak this right now. Language. In yeah. Maria, I did that for you. So <laughs> you, can, you saved her. The you, can be, you can be a lot more direct about what's just happened at the ECB, Maria. What are we looking for in that news conference in 20 minutes' time? Well, look, clearly two things. The 75 basis points, I was very well guided for the market, very well calibrated. The key here would be the signal going into December 75. There's nothing that is new about that. The market was expecting this. And of course, uh, for those that wanted to see real action against inflation, they'll be satisfied uh, with this. And of course, I'm thinking of the German Central Bank. The other real takeaway, which to me is the key here, is the changes to the Teltro program. There's two reasons uh, why this is happening. First of all, the European Central Bank wants to drain some of the excess liquidity uh, on this. Remember, European banks sit on 2 trillion euros of this and they're changing the conditions for it. We need to wait and see right. the technicalities around <clears throat> it, but they are changing the terms. These for the banks, well, they may not be happy, and this could potentially entail some right. litigation. The question is whether they want to take on the central bank or not, but those are the two big things. Change intelligence right. and 75 basis points confirmed. Maria, uh, uh, Attorney Lagarde is not economist Draghi. Explain the inner politics that are behind her at her press conference here in 25 minutes. What does Christine Lagarde need to juggle here within your European continent? Listen, she's not an economist by training, and that's always been the criticism, that she is not technically, perhaps, as Mario Draghi was. Remember, this was the idea that Mario Draghi was the master of markets, that he could really talk markets into doing anything that he wanted. But the reality is, at this point, and you alluded to this in your previous conversation, this is a central bank that has to cater to tensions that are different, to countries that are in different uh, positions. Of course, when you look at Germany, when you look at Italy, these are sitting on two opposite sides of the spectrum. What I hear repeatedly in Frankfurt is she may not be a trained economist. She may not be technically as good as Mario Draghi is. But at this point, you need someone that has a political instinct to get to consensus, appease everyone and calm things down. At one point, and this is very well reported, Mario Draghi was someone who was perceived by some members of the European Central Bank as too aggressive and taking decisions by himself. The fact that she's seen as a consensus maker at at this point, where this is in many ways new territory for the European Central Bank, some tell me in Frankfurt is actually the best way to go about it. Hey, Maria, we'll catch up later. Fantastic coverage, as always. <clears throat> I have to say, Tom, reading through the statement, not really even a whisper of QT in this, and the yeah. Italian move fades a little bit off the back of that. Jeremy Stretch continues with us with CIBC. Jeremy, what will you listen for from Lagarde? She's going to come out. She's going to make a formal written statement. And, I, folks, I'll be blunt. The questioning at the ECB, I think, is sharp as attacks from the journalists there. Jeremy, what's the question you're going to listen for that she needs to answer? Well, I think the, the market is very keen to understand where the terminal rate is and to see whether the ECB is moving away from this whole front-loading narrative and is still just on a mark-to-market meeting-to-meeting process, I should say, uh, and really is going to be driven by the data. So I think we need to see and I'm trying to understand how the terminal rate uh, plays out and see then if that uh, reflects back into how that uh, will play into QT, because uh, as, uh, as you say, from the, from the reading of the language from what I've heard thus far, there seems to be no change in terms of the ECB's language, in terms of its balance sheet adjustment. So I think markets will be very keen to try and understand what that uh, process and what the procedure will be in order to encourage the ECB to consider uh, rowing back its balance sheet through 2023. Jeremy, I'm curious your view on how Christine Lagarde should approach the very increasing, increasingly political question of raising rates into a downturn. How much does she have to acknowledge the downturn in order to pro provide some conviction to markets that they really are going to hike as much as they're saying? I think the ECB does have to uh, remind itself and remind markets, I should say, that uh, its primary ethos is to control inflation. 
And if we think back to the creation of the ECB all the way back in the late 1990s, it came out of the Bundesbank. And of course, as we know, the Bundesbank was driven by that uh, fear and determination to hold down inflation. So I think the ECB needs to remind the market that that's really its primary focus. Yes, it has to do some and make some fairly painful and, and unpalatable decisions when we are undergoing a slowdown. Uh, but I think also the bank will need to be mindful of the fact that some of those uh, inflationary pressures are starting to diminish, but they need to remind the market that primacy of inflation is the preeminent factor. And if they can bear their down on inflation, that will provide a more constructive backdrop for the latter stages of 2023 and into 2024. Jeremy, wonderful to hear from you, sir. Thanks for being with us through the first 25 minutes of this Thank hour. You. Jeremy Stretcher, CIBC, Euro dollar session lows, negative three quarters of 1%, just about holding on to parity. Haven't seen a 99 handle just yet this morning, but getting very close to it. Italian yields fade, they were higher. Now they're lower on an Italian tenure by a couple <laughs> of basis points. For everything in that statement, they said so much without saying much at all. And for that reason, there's not even a whisper of QT in this on, on my first and second read, Tom. And I think that's why the Italian yield story is back in a way. Well, so an incredibly vague statement on two big issues, Tom, QT and the future of interest rates. I'm doing math on Italy, and I did a very fancy study only on the Bloomberg you can do. And it takes me back to 2014. So I believe I'm back eight years on Italian-German spreads, and we're out well over one standard deviation. What are the consequences, John, if the Italian-German spread widens? For Christine Lagarde. They were clearly uncomfortable with 250. I wouldn't say they're comfortable with 220, but it's a relative game, Lisa. 220 is obviously better than 250. And based on this morning, things are heading in the right direction. But they're heading in the right direction this morning because they're <clears> not <throat> talking about QT. So let's wait for the news conference because someone's going to ask about it, aren't they, in the next 60 minutes? How much do we get any new information whatsoever from this particular statement? It was bang in line, as you said, with expectations. They didn't mention QT and were just basically scraping at the edges to have anything uh, in, in order to uh, make some sort of move. I still am not totally understanding the euro move and why the euro is weakening on this. I don't know. Is that QT? Did you under that, understand that statement at all? <laughs> <laughs> it no, was beautiful. That's, that's what central banking has and become. It was clear, John, after you explained it to that's, me. That's what central banking <laughs> has become. And that's the problem. <clears throat> From New York, this is Bloomberg. Data in America about eight seconds away. Mike McKee runs into the studio to get prepared for this. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just about positive, up by 0.05%. Yields are higher by five basis points in the U.S., the data drops. Mike McKee, what have you got? Well, uh, let's start with initial jobless claims since that's the least important thing today. Two Good job. 217,000. Uh, that compares with 214,000 the prior week. It's lower than anticipated. So jobless claims are telling us that the labor market is still in good shape. Now, GDP, third quarter gross domestic product for the first release, 2.6%, which neatly splits the difference between the Atlanta Fed's 3.1% GDP now and the Bloomberg consensus of 2.4%. Remember, the first two quarters of the year, we saw contraction. It doesn't. Uh, I've not seen yet whether uh, any of that has been revised. Personal consumption. Uh, waiting on that number here. I'll have to look into this. Uh, personal income, personal consumption. Yeah, we'll we'll look for it in just a second. But um, the. GDP price index, which is not really widely followed because it's a quarterly number, is 4.1%. Mm. Uh, Durable goods orders up four tenths, not quite as good as expected. 0.6% uh, was the consensus. X transportation down five tenths. And capital goods orders, non defense X air down seven tenths. Now that tells you that maybe businesses are starting to pull back because of the higher cost of investment. And shipments were down 0.5%. Uh, so it does suggest that also that uh, business spending is a little bit weaker than the uh, markets may have hoped for, uh, given the uh, the Fed and what they have been doing. Mike, you can run us through the details in a moment. I'll run through the market. So the move in the bond market this morning was yields up. It fades. Bear in mind, there's a big rally in the Bund market in Germany off the back of this ECB decision. So that factors into this move as well. The 10-year yield on a Treasury at the moment up about a basis point was up four or five just moments ago. Equity futures a leg higher off the back of this, now positive a half of 1%. And the dollar even stronger, Tom. Euro dollar negative seven-tenths of 1%. Briefly, just briefly, 
Italy off the back of the ECB, we did get a 99 handle right. on Euro dollar, Tom. Just a brief break of parity this Just morning. Help me with the date calendar here. November 2nd is a Fed meeting, and inflation is November after 10th. that Fed meeting. November 10th. Did they get a view, Mike McKee, at the Fed of what inflation is going to be 8, 9, 10 days before the report? No, but we do get the PCE uh, number, which is the Fed's favorite and preferred okay. indicator. We get that tomorrow. We get that tomorrow so for the month of September. So that's the is the market update. getting out in front of that of a of a disinflationary trend? I, I don't think so, not yet. Um, they're going to. We've got seventy five priced in, and you do have still the idea of a rate cut next year. But uh, the Fed, this Fed, and you were talking about it uh, just before uh, the ECB decision. Um, this Fed is going to be marked uh, meeting to meeting for a while. Uh, as they see the data come in. Let's take a look at some of the numbers in the GDP. And here's the one that really jumps out, residential. Uh, the Fed has clamped down, mortgage rates have shot up, and residential subtracts uh, is down by 26.4% over the second quarter, uh, the residential contribution. Do you have a GDP, GDP percentage of that? Is that easy for you to garner? How well, it, uh, uh, residential is just is? over 1% as part of the, uh, the, the overall GDP. Can, can you explain what that means in terms of subtract? 26.1%. Well, it, it's not subtracting. It's 26% lower than it was. Than it was. the year. Okay, so this means that basically the momentum is contributing to this. How much, when you dig into the features of the GDP report, does it highlight this weakness that people were talking about below the surface, even if you get a rebound in the uh, average or, you know, just you sort of uh, year-over-year comp? Just quarter, looking quarter through comp. that now, uh, we got weakness in business spending. Non-residential fixed uh, is up by, uh, it looks like, as uh, up by 3.7%. Um, that's a little bit better than it was, but when you break that down and you take uh, structures, structures fell by 15.3% out of that. Equipment's up 10.8. So business investment hung in there, but wasn't great. And the, the personal consumption number, 1.4% is down from 2% in the second quarter, up slightly from 1.3% in, uh, in the first quarter. Consumers are spending, but they're not spending a whole lot. Uh, now, the other things we want to look for uh, are government spending. Government spending still fairly uh, strong. I'm a little surprised uh, state and local, 1.7, they're the ones who have the money at this point. The federal government's been cutting back, but a lot of this spending is on national defense, 4.7%. So, you know, uh, they are replacing all that stuff they are sending over to Ukraine. Mike, would you like to translate this corporate headline? from the McDonald's CEO, sees a mild to moderate recession in the United States. What is a mild to moderate recession in the United States? You know, there's a, there's a lot of questions about how you define that because the Fed has, some Fed officials have suggested something along those lines. And it seems to be what they're talking about is a small contraction in GDP, but a not very big rise in unemployment. Uh, if the Fed got to 4.4%, which they had forecast, you might be saying, well, okay, that's uh, a mild recession. But a lot of people say they're going to have to go higher than that. Um, quickly looking at the other aspects of this, which always <clears throat> fall into uh, the question of how did this work out, exports uh, were up by 14.4% and imports down by 6.9%. So trade contributing significantly to the overall uh, package here. Inventories up by 61.9 billion. They were up by 110 billion in the second quarter. So inventories are subtracting from uh, growth and uh, exports are adding to growth at this point, net exports. So uh, right. the, it, it is, uh, as Lisa said, an under the hood kind of story for the Fed. I said this morning on uh, early surveillance that uh, this is kind of a uh, non-informational for the Fed. It tells them some things about the composition of the economy, but doesn't change their What's view of what they need to do. Is, that, is, is there a show before this one? There's, there's, an, there's an early there's surveillance, an early and one. then there's early, there's early an, surveillance. There's an early, early one. Early, early surveillance. What time did they wake up for that? A Manus Cranny's doing it That is brutal. What time did they wake up for that? It's a Manus Cranny production. They're that just is, getting up now. And you get up for that, too. <laughs> that is out of order. It I is, only woke up 20 minutes ago. Oh, the ECB right. came out, yeah, and then I, I sent everyone back to sleep. Yeah, I know. I even the same. Five fifty-five for late, <laughs> late surveillance as well. Michael McKee, thank you so much, and he'll dive into all that data for you. First look, third quarter GDP. There is a single sentence from Holland Horst and from Nathan Sheets, global chief economist at Citigroup, also is public service to the United States Treasury. And Nathan Sheets joins us right now. Nathan, there's that single line 
of global GDP in 2023. It is well below the typical 3% level. How bad is the global recession of next year? The global economy, as you say, Tom, is looking very soft at the moment. In aggregate, our projection is 2% uh, global growth. If you take out our relatively bullish uh, expectation for China, uh, we see global growth at less than 1% next year, which is right on the border of what's been traditionally associated with, uh, with a global recession. Now, looking at a little bit more at the details, we see early next year, a fairly severe downturn in Europe, including both the euro area and the UK. And then as the year progresses, the monetary tightening uh, in the United States leads to a recession during the second half of the year here as well. So pretty, pretty tough outlook, uh, challenging uh, in a lot of different respects. And, uh, and that's coupled with an inflation outlook that remains very concerning. Nathan, financial conditions have eased. With the backdrop you were talking about, financial conditions have started to ease. And that's because a lot of people are thinking about the Federal Reserve backing away from the pace of hikes, go from 75, maybe down to 50, the size down to 25. Nathan, what do you make of that conversation? I think the Fed has struggled in its communication. It has set up, uh, at least implicitly, a syllogism that if we are serious about inflation, then we go 75 basis points. And when rates are low, it makes sense to have that syllogism. But once you move to 3%, and in November, they'll be at 375, as you move higher, you've got to start casting your determination and framing your determination to fight inflation uh, in, 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 in different ways. Specifically, the Fed can say we move substantially, and that reflects our commitment. And if you don't uh, uh, believe that we're committed, just watch what we're going to do. So I do think they're in a tough situation where they've got to pivot. They can't take rates up at 75 basis points uh, rate indefinitely. And uh, the markets are interpreting that as the Fed kind of pivoting off inflation determination, which I think is a misinterpretation of where they are. I'm looking right now at some of the GDP components. Michael McKee was breaking them down, and we saw housing. He mentioned housing, and he just clarified that residential investments subtracted 1.37 percent from GDP. This is a quickly moving story. Under the hood, how much are other inflationary components offsetting some of these disinflationary moves that we're seeing in the housing market, that we're seeing in retail, that we're seeing in used car prices that you could see on the margins around the economy? Very clearly, we are now in a dynamic of disinflation in terms of goods uh, prices. That is clearly happening. We expect that it's going to come off quite sharply in coming months. Similarly, the shelter prices are persistent the way they're calculated in the indexes. But when we're getting these monster declines in residential investment, that's pointing to a very soft housing market. But where the, the heart of inflationary pressures remains is in the non-shelter services. And that is tied to the hot labor market, rising wages, and rising services inflation. That is what the Fed's worried about. And uh, that's what the Fed uh, is targeting here effectively, is they've got to see a more contained numbers in terms of non-shelter services price inflation. And that may yet take a while. I look, Nathan, at how we're going to recalibrate. We're going to recalibrate off this press conference. John, what, in four minutes? Something like that. We're going to recalibrate November 2nd. Frame the Citigroup look for next year. I'm going back to your stunning global GDP call of 2% next year. What is your year opening report going to look like? Give us a heads up. So uh, what, we're, what we're seeing at the moment, uh, and it's looking pretty durable in my mind, uh, we're calling next year uh, rolling recessions in the global economy. Uh, uh, we're going to see various countries turn down. Uh, uh, the vast majority of GDP will see a downturn. 
that would ex particularly be accentuated and exacerbated if the Chinese economy ends up being uh, somewhat softer. And instead of the five and a half percent we're forecasting, if it's more like this year at, uh, at three and a half. And so you've got this on the growth side, and then you also have central banks that are gonna have to, uh, early in the year, continue to hike. And as the year rolls on, uh, our expectation is hold those, those rates at high levels. So uh, next year is gonna be a, a, a challenging year. I'm kind of already turning the page to 2024. There you go. Skip 2023 right already. Skip yeah. 20. Yeah, that sounds exactly. so much like Nathan. That's, that's what we need from a former government official. Yeah. Dr. Sheets, that was brilliant. Nathan Sheets, Just... city. Nathan, thank you. In the next month, as you all know at home, we're going to get the annual outlooks, Tom from so many of these it, banks. And I wonder if they yeah. take the Nathan Sheets view and just say, yeah, in 2024, <laughs> this is what we think. And rule number one here is the Pharaoh rule, folks, is the, the annual outlook really starts in March. March 31 or so, yeah. which I think is actually pretty smart. John, I, I just got to say this. If you take me back to 2006, if you take me and Mike McKee back to 2006, it is unthinkable that we would frame sub 3% global GDP that with a buoyant China. It was literally not in the framework that we we thought about, right? No, you I mean, can't get it. was it's, it's not you even, even an outlier view anymore, about. Mike. It's not yeah. even an outlier view. A two-handle on global GDP kind of sounds like the, the view global, right now. Global recession is basically what you're going to get. We know Europe's probably already there. The Swedes today uh, basically uh, said that their, their um, confidence numbers were so weak that that essentially tells them they're going to be in recession. So you're looking at recession in Europe. You're looking at probable recession in the United States. And for all intents and purposes, China's growth rate is, for them, a recession. We're getting that commentary from the CEOs right now. Comcast, which owns Sky in the UK, of course. The Comcast CEO moments ago sees pressure on Sky from a weaker European economy. I talked about McDonald's coming out with a series of headlines. The CEO has made a few comments this morning. Bear in mind that EPS was a beat, revenue was a beat, sales were a beat, but this is what he has to say on the economy. He sees a mild to moderate recession here in the United States. He goes on to say, listen to this, Tom, more significant recession in Europe. Franchisees are under financial pressure in Europe, even talks about China, still a challenging environment in China, I, sees increasing uncertainty, unease in the economy. Our financial conditions index, Goldman Sachs has a great index as well. There's others as well. But it's made up of like eight, nine, ten soups of ratios by really smart people, not me, figuring this out. The European financial conditions index, John, is by itself. Maybe it's war. But the fact is, it is unique and discreet compared to other nations. Euro dollar right now, negative Lisa going into this news conference with President Lagarde. We're down about six tenths of one percent on the euro. If you can make sense of the moves and the pretty aggressive moves right after this particular news uh, <coughs> release, uh, please let us know. But I personally can't really translate the why behind it, other than perhaps some, you know, overthinking, deep analysis. You're going to make this my problem. Hundred percent. I'm going to make it. You're the foreigner. Problem.